OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. Welcome, it's half past seven, you're welcome to going to BAM and uh, pre show discussion ongoing. I'm here, Colin Buick is there. Hey Adrian, good morning. And the big Lebowski is over there in the corner. Morning Shane. Good morning, how are things folks? Oh wow, happy Friday. How's everybody doing? Happy Friday. Flying it. Very good. Great fun Just looking morning. at us here. Yeah. Probably How's that going for you? Just wanted a, probably needed a darker colour. We're all decked out this morning in the finest of threads from the needle, if that's how you put it, mm-hmm. of uh, Paul Galvin via Dunn Stores um, the Lions Collection as I think he's briefly mentioned to us before we must have him back in again and have a deep dive on that but some lovely stuff he sent us in a rail overnight so we're all decked out I've got the stripy granddad shirt here yeah uh, we, you've been just making the point Colin, before we come in here that they're all sort of no, I've gone for this uh, slick uh, very slick uh, top what you do you don't wear anything that's going to completely dominate the other part of your clothing mm-hmm. so this is my complimentary to what I'm wearing underneath fair but also do look a bit like the leader in The Simpsons. You do. There's something quite uh, dystopian about it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but it's very nice, very nice. I'm a big fan of the Paul Galvin wear in general, as you all know. You about do, half yeah. my wardrobe it's is a Paul Galvin. The big reason why, they're, why, we, why he said, listen, you've been, you've been good to us. Yeah. We'll send you in some stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so reflective, probably of a person. It's certainly on the <clears throat> planar side. You know, when we talk about reflective personalities. Oh, no. Oh, I wouldn't agree with that now like at all. But listen. And Shane, this, like, there really is something for everybody in this range. There is. Even for me. Mm. No, I, I do like Paul Gavin stuff. I've told Paul before, I have a pair of his shoes that I wear quite consistently. Mm. But this one, <coughs> folks, I mean, people can see it there. It's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it's very reflective of your personality. But it's very Friday, and like I woke up this morning and the sun was, the sun was out. Do you know? Oh. Oh. No, like, it's, a, it's a loud shirt. It is. You right. can't wear a loud shirt and be like, well, that's, that's my point. personality. No, that's, my like, point. that's it. That's true. Oh, yeah. I think that is. You've got to do more than that. Like, Good for festivals as well this summer. It's got a lovely, I have to say, the lovely feel, feel about it. it. A little, little bit of stretch. <laughs> but do you feel that? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's pretty good. Summer feel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How do you feel? It's light. It's it is actually bad. very summer feel. You're like it's a family ideal. gathering. It's my first sort of You're like a Sunday afternoon family gathering. Yeah. yeah. It's light and it's, if it's a yeah. sunny day. How do you think it's, yeah, that's what you're wearing. Yeah. Yeah. So is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's Definitely. like, I don't know if it's very obvious on the screen there, but it's like a pink striped. Yeah. Beautiful. The granddad oh, collar as well. Granddad collar, both like granddad yeah, collars. Yeah. The uh, the sleeves up actually says more about personality. I think. What that's does a, that say? That's down to business. I do, I do I'm like this. That's a power move. I do the yeah. same. Oh, as power as move! Yeah. Is it really? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm here for business. Fergie, Fergie used to put his um, hands behind his head in Friday press conferences. Yeah. Slow the pace down. Right. And that's it. you're actually doing the opposite. If anything, you're rolling the sleeves up. So shame. Increasing the pace. Roll any sleeves up. No, no, no. I wouldn't. I'm the opposite. Then. Well, he doesn't need to draw any more attention to himself. I think. Cousins. True. Yeah. We'll play it down from here. Uh, Dunstores.com. If people are looking to head along and get yourself some of that gear, it is uh, really nice stuff. And I'm sure we'll have more of it coming your way over the next few weeks as well. Um, the other thing that we need to mention before we get it. Look, we thought it was football last night. We're getting there. Um, big night in the Hannon household tonight. Oh, huge! The younger sister, Rachel May Hannon. She's Rashi Rachel. Or her middle name is May, but that's her. That's her stage, stage name. name. Stage name she uses. Nice. She good is. Name. Yeah, it's a good name. She's performing on the uh, the Late Late Show this evening. Um, looking forward to that. Her new single, The Boys, which you can stream now wherever you get your songs, Spotify and all the rest. The Boys, Rachel Mayhannon, stream it. Just trying to get into everyone's brains here this morning. <laughs> uh, you'll hear her perform it live on on the Late Late, Late Late Show tonight, which is it's just cool. It's one of Tuberty's last shows. I think mm-hmm. he's maybe only a two or three at most after this. So. Um, should be a lot of fun. The whole family is going to be in the audience. So if you if you spot me in the crowd, you'll be hooting and hollering. Exactly. You don't you don't blend in, Shane. We've don't blend we've in established too that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the height you mean. You don't mean the absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Six foot four and all that. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that is actually it's not, it's not the dodgy shirts. Uh, Seven thirty four. Um, I was lining up a conversation with this morning about like Brighton really should have won that game last night. They were just the dominant team for ninety minutes, mm. ninety plus minutes, and. You know, had a hat full of chances. McAllister came close. Um, Atoma came close. Really, the sort of a game that an, an Evan Ferguson, where he fit, would have oh. flourished in. And I, I felt that was true. And then Luke Shaw's hand uh, pops up in the middle of the box with almost the last uh, action of the game, and he just knew. The second you saw it, once the VAR had a look at that, 
it was going to be um, a criminal act if it hadn't resulted in a penalty. It was blatant and obvious. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, the referee had to go pitch side, take a quick review. A penalty given. Even Luke Shaw afterwards, he came out in an interview on Sky afterwards and very much accepted that. He, he said... I really don't know what my hand was doing there, which I thought was refreshing honesty. So hands up, it was my fault. It was <laughs> very, did. very good on Luke's behalf. I enjoyed the refreshing honesty from Luke Shaw. He's not a player that you hear from too often. I I'd absolutely um, I overflow with respect for somebody who had such a pivotal negative impact on the game that clearly volunteered to come out and speak to the media afterwards as well. Mea culpa. So I thought that was... I'm lucky I know that that's a... Part of the culture of this United team that they're happy to put their it seems hands to be, up, as you it, say. Exactly. I um I actually said after the full time whistle to my housemates last night, I was like, Luke Shaw is going to come out in front of the media. Mm. Like that's just what he does. Yeah. He, t- he tends to do it on good days as well, but he's starting to do it more and more. He seems to be one of these voices that that he's much better at speaking now, Luke Shaw, than he was five years ago. Right. If you look at his interviews five years ago. Uh, he's clearly kind of blended into a le- leadership role. I don't know what his hand was doing up there. Um, I th- he did say in the interview as well he got a yeah. nudge and, and all the rest. And he was pointing out to the free kick that was that led to the corner. He said that was never a free kick. But then how far back do you go? Uh, it probably wasn't a free kick, but that's not an excuse for the for what his hand was doing. I think he's accepting doing. that as well on yeah. some level. It's like, you know, you make whatever rationales you can to get yourself to sleep at night. Yeah, exactly. Um, but Brighton were the better team. They fully deserve the win. Yeah. I'm falling in love with Brighton. They're, oh, they're uh, so much good about the club. They, so they good probably edged it. Attractive play. It was a close good game. Good players. Good manager. Mm-hmm. Uh, Noel Cattle here in the comments saying he thinks that United were the better side. Yeah, there were arguments for the look there. No, the first an established United fan. Uh, Marcus Rashford and Anthony Martial had chances in their left foot, uh, which Jason Steele saved well from Martial and Rashford actually. So yeah. Good save from Steele uh, last night. Um, yeah, very good. Yeah, and good distribution. Karu Matoma, who had a really good game, but it's finishing let him down. He had a brilliant chance in the first half when he intercepted another United defensive mm-hmm. mistake and lapse was true one-on-one with De Gea and could have passed inside to Enciso yeah. but went for the glory and De Gea made a great save. De Gea was very good last night and we yeah. were, we were what were we discussing three, yesterday yeah. in our post show? Most we were sheets. surprising most clean sheets in the Premier League. You're he's right. up there, De Gea, this season. What do you mean he's, he's up first? There. He's got 15. He's got 15, he's got 15 Pope remember. is 13 yeah. and then the two lads, Ramsdale and Alisson. That is 13. a surprise. Yeah. It is because he, he's much maligned like mm. and uh, it was actually off the back of um, Harry Pryor yesterday praising Alison Becker and how brilliant he's been for Liverpool this season and been mm. underrated and we were saying is there something about a goalkeeper when you're kind of uh, unassuming and you just go about your job mm. that you let get left behind especially if you're not contending for a title mm. with De Gea he, the only time we really talk about him is when he makes mistakes yeah it's funny because uh, watching Roberto the same. yeah watching De Zerbi on the, the sideline last night John O'Shea was asked in the road show the other night he says oh, which manager in the wor- who's the best manager in the world right now and he paused for a second, and the first name that came to his mind was Roberto De Zerbi, wow. which I was shocked by. But um, he said he watched him up close when Stoke played Reading or Stoke played uh, Brighton in the FA Cup earlier this season. Yeah, he said just so impressed by his in-game tactics uh, and the way he conducts himself during the match as well. As and there is the some, liveliness of him. Yeah, there's something about him. He was um, getting a full-on workout last night. That is for sure. The chair when he the looked chi- like he was going to rip the chair out. Of the, the chair. Sun, he, he, he took the cover off at half time. Very expensive. Was, I, one, another reason I'm following over Brighton they said to the, they, they uh, invited the TV cameras into the that was brilliant. sound off yeah. just yeah. do it like it's yeah, but, that was brilliant uh, the, the Sky it agreed that at the start of the season, of, they, start have of the season. Ex, they have extra access they can do that in certain to, games for, for, for uh, Brighton uh, or for for the Premier League teams it's part of the new deal so you'll see beforehand well, the, the pundits GoPro. around the pitch you see the GoPro with Ka- Saicedo when you were, oh, they were yeah. shaking hands beforehand you had a go- body cam yeah. on which they did as well uh, but they do it at St James's Park. They're going to. Not all clubs to, are going to sign up. No, I don't. I think you can opt out. Like, but if you want more coverage, um, and Brighton are very savvy that way. Newcastle the, are doing the, the same. The plastic laundry basket at half yeah, time. Yeah, they yeah. all like have given him a bit of a rally, and he was like pulling and dragging. Oh, that reminded me of uh, Arsenal or all or nothing. Every oh, time really? uh, Mikel Arteta oh, okay, was getting yeah, exercise, yeah, yeah. which is pretty much every game mm. back then, he was uh, flake in the skip. Poor skip, like. Um, Oliver Skip <laughs> it was Oliver Skip yeah. Oliver Skip the, uh, was one of the Brighton big wigs on the coverage before yeah, the yeah. Game last night and it was like I just feel as if they're opening the door to everybody Don't they, going, mm. this, we're, we're playing great football with great players we've you know we've we replaced our great manager with an even greater manager and um, you know I think that uh, and so the big wig comes out beforehand I'm doing a disservice there he's like the deputy CEO or something yeah. like that and was like willing mm. to talk about to open himself up to questions from Kelly and from Paul Ince and Jamie Redknapp um, and get into all the very you know you're a selling club Jamie Redknapp asked him and he's like no but sure like what club really isn't a selling mm-hmm. club like even you see those stats they displayed on screen the difference between their transfer business since winter 2021 to now and before then so they were 
basically spending very little and getting very little in. Mm. And since then, they've basically been in profit, like with the amount of uh, money they're making in sales and seemingly getting better. And they have this incredible scouting system mm. where they're they're finding these brilliant young talents, and not just South not Hampton. just Ferguson, mm. but then see so Benanate who played last night. A young lad called Ferguson. Young lad, yeah, so not going to be decent. Like like not just yeah, Ferguson. Yeah, yeah. The, the recruitment is so good that you you almost feel if some of these uh, lads are sold in the next you know McAllister being one of them possibly to Liverpool if that comes to fruition but you, you trust their process to, to bring in new players I also love the mm. you see Lewis Dunk afterwards with mm, Jimmy Carragher very good or Jimmy Redknapp sorry um, like just really good Hold analysis on, at that stage yeah this is it playing out from it's the back new, but even the talk <laughs> the, the, the fact that he was looking at um, if the answer was too quick this would be, on, good. Sure, on. This be good playing out from the back and, and Lewis Dunk was they showed him a few clips and very they were stopping the camera and they were like oh this is how we play out from the back and the pressing from Bruno Fernandes say, leads to one person doing one thing they all know their pattern um, and he was also pointing out the fact that you know I know what number six, number eight, number ten, how they play, and that he could probably slot into the Brighton team and do those jobs. Everyone in the Brighton team knows everyone else's job to the T. Um, so that's that speaks volumes of Deserby. And, and as he said last night, Lewis Dunk, some of the ideas from Deserby we haven't even seen yet. There's yeah. so much more to come. And also, um, like one of my favourite players in the last couple of years when he broke through at Chelsea is Billy Gilmore. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I've seen very little of him at well, Brighton, and he played. Yeah, he played midfield. That's what I'm, and like. But that's how good the side is and he had Casado playing right back last night so can you imagine if he was playing centre mid and they did have Ferguson as an option and I suppose the like you say Adrian how Brighton are everyone's second favourite team I suppose if mm. you're supporters in the Premier League is that they really took it to Manchester United and if you were watching your very first football game last night you would not be able to tell the difference in quality in fact well, like you, you say, say you would say the home team. side are probably shading this yeah. like and United were pretty strong like they had a strong team out like Luke Shaw playing centre half out of position, but I think he's done very well at centre half yes. overall. So it's not like they were massively weakened. Diogo Dallo and Aaron Van Bissaka are in the form of their lives at United. So you look around the team, okay, they're missing Martinez and Varane, but other than that, it was fairly strong. Like mm. I don't think so they that's, it, by that's the way. I, uh, think I, I thought, I thought United. I don't think it was far better. It. I'd say Brighton, uh, Brighton shaded it. I felt them. if it had finished nil nil and Luke Shaw hadn't did what he'd done, that Brighton could have rightly felt, damn it, that one was one to get away, and United would have left the ground going grand. I suppose United had chances as well and they just weren't clinical and even Mar- Martial there's one point in the game where Ten Hag is, is vociferous in the sideline yeah. because Martial's not pressing yeah. like this he man. got in one on one at one point as well didn't yeah. he yeah like there were just chances that they left behind um, I, I was looking forward to Juan Bissaka against Matoma by the way yeah. which kind of yeah kind of but Matoma was okay certainly yeah. not, not uh, oh, Matoma was very good yeah but he, he, he can be much better and his finishing as well I think uh, I'm interested in your point Shane about um you would be confident if they sold all these players that the academy would fill yeah. them in. I just, I, I, or the recruitment. I, I, yeah, and I certainly accept that that could happen over a period of time. But I do think that, like, because I was actually looking at it last night and thinking, if you had a shopping list of some of the bigger clubs, particularly, if you had a shopping list of the players that might get out of there, and Saicedo is probably one of those, McAllister is one of those, Matoma is definitely yeah. one of those, uh, Solly March is probably one of those. Oh, I could have got goal of the season. Um, <laughs> a little run from deep. Yeah, lovely goal. Lovely Jason run. Steele, looking at him last night, could be one of those. Sanchez out of the team now. And he's um, a fine goalkeeper. The manager is probably one of those, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So, like, suddenly when you remove that cohort of six or seven players, because, like, we're all very excited about, and, and I'm looking at this, admittedly, through an Evan Ferguson lens, and we're all very excited about what he might bring to the thing. I think that his development can take a backward step if you remove that those five or six. And I'm not saying that they're going to get rid of all of those. You can be damn certain that they're going to get rid of some of them because of McAllister and some of the back pages this morning have been linked with Liverpool. I don't know, yeah. is it like 80 million quid? That's the sort of thing that'll probably happen. Some penalty. Mm. Some penalty. He took that but, well. So I think if you remove all of those, Brighton are probably in a relegation battle. If you remove everyone from their team? I'm talking, not talking about everybody, but those names that I've mentioned specifically, I do think that obviously, like Shane That's said, tough. some academy players will come in. Some I know, but but the difficulty that they have, tying it back to the point about the deputy CEO talking about their, the them being a selling club, oh, yeah. the difficulty they'll have is that the reality is Liverpool will come in with 80 million for McAllister, there'll be 56 million bids for Matoma, maybe even more, um, and Brighton won't be able to stop that mm. you know like I mentioned the Southampton example earlier very deliberately in that do you remember a few years ago we spoke about Southampton in the exact same terms and we said oh well look at if they lose Lalana, um Shaw there at that time whoever the the um, yeah. there was a real core to talent that had been developed through this amazing scout mm-hmm. and through the system and we thought well this is just built for the future mm. uh, in reality I yeah but uh, Brighton are outperforming what Southampton did then 
you know Except and so like yeah. they're they're shooing for Europa League and it'll be interesting to see what they do or how they perform next season when they have to yeah. juggle the European football also they're getting Joe Pedro from Watford so it's another contender mm. for uh, for a sat up front with Ferguson by the way Ale- Alexis McAllister will be some signing for Liverpool mm. like he just and he has the it's not just the play but I think you need a certain attitude to play at some of those top four or five teams uh, off the pitch you need to conduct yourself in a certain way like I, I look at some of the Liverpool signings like Gapo mm. similar strikes me as a player who, who has a, an, an air about him off the pitch McAllister as Paul Inns said last night in the coverage he's so humble for a man he's just won the World Cup Yeah, he's just scored a last minute penalty to beat Manchester United like and, and possibly help his club get European football and yet he's thinking about other people he's thinking about the young players of the club he's mentioning players back home in his native country in Argentina as well he's just so down to earth mm. for a man that was heavily involved in a World Cup win just just months ago the cojones on him to uh, for that for the, the way he takes a penalty generally to stand there for five or six seconds yeah I know way, so once the whistle goes players go I just need to get this over get it done get in get it taken he Soaps stands it up. there for he five does, or six yeah, seconds that's, that's true wait it's good like point. even from a goalkeeper point of view you must be thinking when is he going to start running here I think yeah. he's, he's getting the keeper's head because the keeper has to stand there for that portion of time as well yeah. so, no rule against that so if the referee blow, the referee blows the whistle, how long does that take come the penalty? For? How long how long are you allowed to stand there for? Well, it's never you can't. They're not going to blow the whistle and oh, forget it. So well, like imagine if he goes free out. If he's yeah. if he just I, what I was thinking was at some point the referee is going to have to step in. So imagine if he goes <laughs> steps in and McAllister just starts his run and they're like ah. Well, it's like yeah, it's, yeah. The it's like the driving the test. The driving test. There's no minimum speed, but there, there is a max speed. But there's no minimum speed. You just make gradual progress. Well, so we had to I, make gradual if, you were, if you were doing three kilometers an hour, the tester would be like yeah, you God, have failed. There's some countries year. there. There's uh, if you if you go below the speed limit, you get fined. Yeah, on yeah, yeah, that's good. Just, just as dangerous to drive very slowly below and the it, speed it, limit. Yeah, if you go like you could get you get pulled sense. over. Oh, yeah, no, as in not below, right. not below, not below the speed limit. No, sorry, like, below the sorry. If you're driving too slowly, is yeah, what I should say yeah, to yeah. clarify. Well, that's a totally different. If point. you're driving too slowly, now <laughs> totally you get pulled point. over and it's like Jesus, you're driving very you're dangerously there. What so what said. were you saying there? How did that tie into what you just because said? I was just saying he can make gradual progress. You know, there's no there's no necessary number you can put on it. This is the obvious statement now, right? Jeez, that'd but be a McAllister's like, penalty you know, to do is, is the. An hour, right? like, just, <laughs> is the it, I clarified myself though, down. and now we're going back to it. Okay, but I've clarified are, it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. McCall- you've, you've undone, you're getting oh, a bit hotter, yeah. The, cork, the cork's coming out there. It is well. roasting. Yeah. So uh, McAllister's penalty, right, was perfect. <laughs> I, like obviously, but I've never yeah. seen a penalty saved in a top corner. No, it's true. Ever. If, so if you can do it consistently. So if you can do it consistently, but it takes so much uh, nerve and courage and to actually do that. At, was it was it Redknapp afterwards pointing out was when they were chatting to him, he you were in bed at this point, but he was No, I was I I, I was at a back, right, right yeah. angle to the ball on the left hand oh, side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which to bring it to run this way and kick it that yeah, way it makes yeah. it even more forces more the keeper to go difficult. that way also David De Gea was never saving that penalty I mean, sorry no, even, even if the penalty gone towards David De Gea he would not have saved the penalty because David De Gea does not save penalties ah which is he can't save a penalty for his life no I know you're no, you're, 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 no, that, you're correct in the no you're correct but um, in this instance um, it's different Fountain's Town Co- Forlan by the way I just want to bring attention to this comment from uh, Fountain's Town Forlan on YouTube here it says De Gea was disco- uh, concussed last night but there's no concussion in a man's game like football and it certainly leapt out to me last night that he had taken a ball square in the face from Matoma's shot that time mm. And was prone for ages. Was clearly the mark of the ball was visible in his head. The medic was in and was trying to establish what was going on. It didn't seem to be any any um, indication that they, he would take a step out or that he'd be substituted or anything like that. Um, and also, the medic was covering his mouth yeah, while yeah, he was. Yeah. I didn't like that. I just didn't like it. It seemed to be a. I, I don't want people to know what I'm saying. Well, I presume they tend to do that just for the players' privacy. For health reasons, I just didn't like it because what what is we should know the process of what's happening there, you know. Like it's not like we don't know. We it's not like a condition that we don't know. We've seen yeah. him get hit and square in the head by the ball, so he's doing some concussion protocol, I presume, mm. with him. But you must have passed, you know. And like, what is the nature of the conversation that you need to be hiding? I don't like it. I have to say, it would definitely. I t- take a few minutes trying to get my head around what it was that was going on that was just a little bit yeah not right. In lighter news as well, I've noticed that uh, players aren't taking corners. In a designated corner spot, they're putting oh, the ball yeah, ahead yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. And then well, last night, yeah. the linesman corrected someone. One of the players taking yeah, the corner, right and I put it, put it back yeah. there. And then he he replaced the ball, but he put it in the same place. Well, and linesman saw it and was like, uh, "I can't say it again." He but, he, but it was still outside. It was, quadrant. but the, the rule is that the uh, edge of the ball has to be hovering over the edge. It didn't touch it. 
No, no, it doesn't have to touch it. The edge of the ball has to be hovering over the same airspace as the line. There was no hover. If it went to, if the corner went to VAR, there was a hover. right, and it was over the ball. Like, you know, the aerial view there, the nice one they give us. It was there was there it, was, was, it the wasn't even person, it wasn't even related to the, the line, corners. Well, back you, like. it was hard to tell that because I was watching this exact easy, thing with the same interest. Easy to tell. It was hard to tell, but the lines person was stood right beside it, looking she at. Was it put it to the edge of the box? I think you point, should fight right? more about this because this is a massive <laughs> issue. This Burning is a big, issue. big it concern. It could, yeah. it could be the difference, Shane. I should I should mention Frank's commentary on YouTube says Paul's range is top class, very reasonable too. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Paul himself typing in. Very nice. <laughs> um, do you know what we should mention I don't before we move on? Us. Napoli. Yeah. Oh. Winning their first uh, title <coughs> uh, since 1990, since the Diego Maradona days. And for Look people who can't scenes. see, they were playing a video here at the moment. It's overhead of the city of Naples and there's fireworks all over Who's the gap. video is that? Uh, oh, it's doing the rounds on uh, on Should Twitter. Can we, we give a bit of credit here? Oh, we will, yeah. Um, oh, the noise of the fireworks, lovely. Can you hear that? Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, it reminds me of the scene from Point Break. Tanner that's Reeves Colin Gary Miller. Boosie. Colin Miller. At Miller, Miller underscore Colin on Twitter. It's like LA. He's a football writer with the Murr. Very good. Oh, Thanks for that. Look uh, at the scenes, lads. This, this gone viral overnight, so I'd say you'll see it sure, if in any way. Social media inclined. My, my housemate Andy made the point last night, and it made me a little bit Brilliant. sad. Mar- Diego Maradona passes away and then Argentina win the World Cup and Napoli win the Scudetto for the first time in 33 years and he's not he- not here to see it um, which made me a little bit sad inside but but fantastic scenes for the Napoli fans I mean Jesus 33 years what are you, smi- what are you smiling at there? Is no it? I'm just it made me a little bit sad inside <laughs> thought you were smiling at and then him. you put on your shirt and you just thought no, yeah this this, this, this lightened up my mood for the Friday morning um, let me know what you, what you think, people. I know it's a it's a proper Friday shirt. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, there's, it's a bit of, there's a bit of love coming in for it. A lot of comfort there for it as well. Um, will we do what's coming up and then come back to a few comments. Yeah. That, the run of things we're gone ten to eight on this uh, Friday morning. Delighted to have you with us. For if you're talking shirts or football, whatever it is you're having yourself. Uh, here's what's coming up on the show uh, from uh, between now and ten. Uh, Ronan Agara standing by. We'll talk to him in a couple of minutes' time as the La Rochelle have booked themselves into another. Um, Champions Cup final so we'll get his thoughts on that in just a moment Kathleen McNamee will get into the nuts and bolts of what's been happening in uh, European football this week and looking ahead to the WSL we may even come to the Gianni Infantino comments uh, with Kathleen at 10 past 8 this morning Alan Quinlan will give his own reflections on the Champions Cup semi-finals and look ahead to the URC quarters as well we're going to have the Friday fire pit where we'll be discussing people are people are exercised by King Charles um What's the coronation? See the third. It's being screened on Irish TV, so that'll be apparently coming up. Shane's, uh, Shane's not into that. No. Rona McNamee, the Tyrone footballer, will be with us to discuss the darkness uh, into light, uh, which will happen this weekend, and that's at 10 past nine. And Imogen Cotter was chatting to Shane, really interesting story and a really interesting speaker, and that's coming your way at half past nine this morning. That's us. You're good to go, Colm. You're to what uh, we're all waiting for. You're uh, you're a tired and um, thumbs up sharp. And thanks a million for your company. Thanks for having me again. You make it so easy. It's always so fun, Colm. Yeah. Yeah, you make it great. Yeah, you two are like a fighting couple, by the way. Every Friday after they deal, deal with this crap. Not, it's through, not it's through love, though. Uh, it's through love. <coughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It all, Through it. love. Glad I'm not sitting between you. You know. Seven fifty-three. Just wish we had this creative tension. Yeah, I know. It's Friday good. morning. Ron Gary, Good morning to you. Hi, Adrian. How, Shane. Morning. How are you morning. keeping? Good. Good, yeah. yeah Life is good. good. Yeah. Life is good. Seems good week. A bit of a jumpy line. Are we okay? I can hear you there. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah. Uh, short week. Short week. Played on Sunday. So uh, we have Monday, Tuesday off. Trained Wednesday, Thursday. We're what? Friday morning. Now we have today off. We'll do a small bit tomorrow morning, play at nine o'clock local time tomorrow night in the Velodrome in Marseille. So, uh, exciting times uh, this time here. The Beating on both fronts, so um, that's where we want to be. The line is a bit ropey, actually, but we'll we'll bear with it and we'll uh, we'll work through it. What um, <clears throat> those you mentioned a couple of days off, so I'm sure the players obviously you've you've mentioned that you had a few drinks or you'd a bite to eat after the game on uh, Sunday night. Uh, I'm sure from the players' point of view, there's a bit of. Um, oh, we've lost him, have we? I think he just, we have. He's just yeah, fixing yeah, it up we'll there. Get yeah. him, uh, we'll get him back. We'll get him I back also want to know where Rogers got that white Adidas retro uh, hoodie he's wearing, the zippy, zipper. Nice. Fantastic bit of gear. He'd be an Adidas man, of course. Of course, of course, yeah. Never forget. Um, Colm is still with us. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Ah, there he is. 
Yeah, look at this. this is what I stayed, huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, had we any good? We had plenty of comments Loads coming in. Loads of good ones, yeah. Loads that you can tell. I don't know if we have your mic up, do we? Uh, Ronan's back, is he? Ronan. Yeah, yeah, that's You're much there. better. Sorry. It was a bit fuzzy. That's all right. The Gremlins are in the system. I was going to ask you just about the um, break that you gave the players that you mentioned for a couple of days, and I'm sure that they take that as a break and they check out and they do whatever they're doing. From your point of view, is it business as usual almost in terms of your planning, or can you afford yourself a little bit of downtime? Ah, there we go. The old the, colour bars. The old multi coloured screen there. <clears throat> they're never a great sign, are they? Oh. Um, Shifty Lad says, Colm, you're actually wrong about the corner, and Adrian is 100% right. Oh. The outer circumference of the ball just needs to be perpendicular to the white line. Here's what I learned growing up, right? You won't like this. I'm going to warn you. They, well, I'm also assuming this is going to be nothing, no relevance to the comment. You won't like this at all. I was told growing up, right? You should never tell anyone they're wrong. Well, I'm just reading out Shifty Why? Lad's comments. So I'm saying to Shifty Lad. Yeah. Uh, because if you say to someone you're wrong, Right? Yeah. You immediately get their backs up. It's antagonistic. Oh. Sure, I'm not going to agree with it. Whatever <clears> you say after that, I'm not going to agree with you. But but for you could say. So, so moving yourself past that because you're I don't think you're right there. To know, I don't, uh, think, I don't, right think, I don't yeah. think you're right there. Oh, that's Shifty that one for you. But I like his confidence. He's he knows that he's. Um, I have no problem with the overall comment. That's a more positive. So you're saying way. that you are actually mistaken. Oh, if 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 it can be proven to me that I was mistaken, no <laughs> <I find laughs> yeah. an aerial angle of the <laughs> I, I like our audience anyway. do get a good insight into the inner workings of your mind. It was uh, we could piece together great, a whole pile of clips that I great think. bit of advice that I got. I tell you, I'm telling you, it gets you far. Like, mm. don't be telling anyone they're wrong. I uh, I like that the bit of positivity. It's uh, all about our language, isn't it? The use of all language. about the use of language yeah, and tone. Yeah. It's very important too. But also, why would he dance around? What he just he knows that's the. Well, I say he's one of my favorite commenters. Yeah. Dad, so I've no problem saying it to it. Uh, John Claffey says I was told to speed up during my driver's test. Ah, here. Yeah. You have to Not make a great sign, is it? Did you both pass first time? No, I failed. I did mine when I was like. You didn't fail. You just fa- you just uh, didn't. What's a positive, more positive? I way did of just didn't that? pass. <laughs> you didn't pass. Yeah, yeah. You could say that uh, if it's factually yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. No, it's Something factually correct that I failed. I first time, just. I think. I think. Or a couple of times. Whatever the whatever the lower age, lowest age to do your driving test is 17, 16? 17 and a half. <clears throat> is it 17 and a half? Yeah, you get your theory at 16 and then 17 you can get your oh, It was different. When I did it, you did everything in one day. There was no theory test and driver's yes. test separately. It was all you do it all in one day and I failed it. Yourself. And I, when I was, I, I, I have a feeling I was 16 and when I was 16 I looked about 10 and uh, somebody had said to me afterwards that you had failed before you before the driver's test began. I walked in the door there, yeah. yeah. I, I passed first time at 17. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to say. I, uh, you haven't even done your test yet. I did it by... Did you? July 2008. All right. The well, test I'll, centre I'll is the te- Do you not remember when you? Uh, pass- don't you have to try to be cool here? Like you be yourself. Be yourself. The uh, the driving test centre. Mm. It's not even a driving test centre anymore. It's defunct, right? The test, including the theory <laughs> test, right? <laughs> right start, in fact. Hold on. Started at four pm <clears> yeah. and it finished at four nineteen. It was amazing. We, we Nine went, minutes. We just went for nineteen. Oh, 19 yeah, minutes. We went, for, we went for, <laughs> we went for a little spin. Or I went for a little spin. And the hill start is a joke. Like, yeah. It was a joke. Like, you, didn't, you, didn't, even, you didn't need the handbrake. It was, bar- it wasn't a hill. It was barely ah. a hill. Ah, lads, it was ridiculous. The, miles. the three point turn yeah, as well. Yes. Or sorry, reversing around the corner. You never do that again. No, when have you ever? Ah, no, but it's yeah, a bit like most of the stuff you learn in school. You're like, ah, yeah, I'm not going to use that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ronan, you're back with us? Yeah, I am. We're uh, we're on the phone line, so we're 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 going to hold up here. I'm sure. Um, yeah, I was just asking about the break that the players had, and whether you had an opportunity over those couple of days to unwind as well, or was it kind of business as usual? Um, no, it was a short week. You know, Monday morning comes on quickly, back into the school run and uh, other duties. You know, so it was. Um, Monday, Tuesday, well, Tuesday, getting the review of the Exeter game and looking at the opportunities that we took and the opportunities we left behind. So then Wednesday, Thursday were two kind of uh, busy days and then we're already on Friday morning. Yeah, it comes around quickly. Um, it's an unbelievable achievement and congratulations, by the way. It's uh, what you're doing there. We, we had talked to you the last time you were on talking saying that we're, you're no longer an underdog, but I mean, uh, it just gets hammered home. And I rewatched the game during the week. The um, uh, the way that you outmuscle them, uh, superior scrum, the skills, the game plan, it was such a comprehensive victory. It was never really in doubt. Is that your feeling of it? Uh, yeah, you know? it was. Yeah, it was. I think it was. It was um, a combined performance for probably maybe 55 minutes. You know, I think we started quite slowly, but then 
we scored 40 points unanswered in the semi-finals is powerful. We have powerful players and uh, I think people saw what um, happens when you combine, I suppose, aggressive backs with fast backs with an accurate kicking game with forwards that um, are big and are powerful and are strong. Mm. The, the accurate kicking game like it was really noticeable the sort of kick passes early and then <laughs> kick passes often as well and there weren't always those kind of long raking cross field kicks sometimes there were short deft touches um, and it sounded like from your comments after the game that that's not always part of the game plan uh, but it seems like your 10 can play it whatever way he sees fit in front of him um, yeah but Adrian it has to be part of every game plan you know that's I think the difference now in, in Good players becoming great players of their capacity to go to the draw and pull out attacking kicks. You know, you can look how easily you can reward forwards by scoring with that capacity to see space, pull the trigger, kick it, hit it. So, something we try and make players aware of, but it's the same policy. You have to keep knocking them over the head, over the head, over the head, and eventually, hopefully, it funnels through into their... uh, I suppose, um, menu of players. I suppose another credit running to, to yourself and the coaching team is the ability to, to adapt in-game. and That's certainly something you noticed uh, against Exeter as well, whether it's personnel changes or positional changes. Um, and Will Skelton kind of made the point, I think, in advance of the Exeter match as well. He was uh, praising yourself and, and the difference between the team last year and this year. And he was saying, you know, totally different group this year to last year, different personalities. But Will was very complimentary of the way in which you've managed to adapt and take the team on a little bit further. Now you have to, you you know, you, you know, evolve where you die or get better or get beaten is the Crusaders' language, you know, and Andrew Goodman will have plenty of that for feeding into the Leinster camp in a few weeks' time. But it makes it exciting coaching against coaches that you really respect, coaching against an environment that you um, really admire. So this is where you want to be. This is uh, everything that... 10 months leads into to get to final of the Champions Cup so um, the boys are excited um, To go back to Hastoy Aaron and it, like an incredible get and I know there was competition to get him at the time when you did like he's still only 25 uh, not has he has he a couple of French caps but maybe not a huge amount Yeah he does yeah I yeah. think maybe two is it Maybe a couple yeah and doesn't, yeah, couple. doesn't doesn't overly seem to be in consideration which is remarkable given the way you watch him uh, play a game. Uh, play the game last weekend. Yeah, and he only get better, Adrian. In the fact that he spent his whole career in Poe with their fight relegation, mm. so it's a different mindset. He's, I suppose, a disciple of that environment. Now he's coming into a club that are performing well, but that wouldn't have the history of a Toulouse or a Toulon, for example. But um, he he wants to get there, and you. Really, really get better. It's just, uh, you know, I can understand that if when it's coming in as a number ten with a lot of powerful personalities in the forwards and with a Jonathan Dante, you feel sometimes reluctant to take ownership of the team. But that's the big step for him to make it his team, and um, you're never dependent on one guy, obviously, uh, because we've a smashing young. Um, on French under twenties out of uh, Hugo he's, uh who has come on and done well. So there's always challengers looking to take the role of a number ten in any club. But uh Antoine has done very well. Um, but when you I suppose break down his his attributes it's easy to see why. We just have to keep him um uh, humming. What how would you describe him like what would you to the lay person um what sort of an out half is he? Um, quite instinctive, uh, fast, um, aggressive, probably in his play. Um, and I'm not trying to make him structured. I'm just trying to get him to understand his reason why he does this or that in a game. Mm. There's always. Uh, room for the creative, instinctive player, but the thinner the air gets, the more you have to have, I think, preparation done. And he 
is beginning to appreciate that if he prepares well, he usually performs well. You can't rock up on a Saturday at this level and play well, which some people think you can. Yeah. Was there was there a bit of an instinct? Was there was that part of his makeup before arriving at La Rochelle? Or oh yeah, been, completely. Yeah. yeah. Like you watch him playing for Poe, he take on the line three out of five times. I was saying to him a month or two ago, I haven't seen you take on the line in a long time. That's your game. Play it. But uh, very respectful and maybe it never helps, I think, at the initial stages when you have a uh, a 10-10 relationship with your boss and the fact that obviously understand the position very well. Um, and... I mean, the reality is they never say it, but they're under a cloud or under a big shadow when I'm their boss. But it's for me to make them feel very, very comfortable. And we're getting there. I had that with Richie Moang at the Crusaders where for four or five months it was a very strained relationship because uh, he probably felt I was hard on him, but I was only hard on him because I could see he was world class. And I think it's the same with Antoine. Another world class player, and he's a man we, we mentioned on the show before, Ronan, is Tower Kerr Barlow. And I, and I think you had pointed out before that you, you probably rated him just behind DuPont, maybe as uh, best number nine in the world. Um, and again, outstanding last weekend, a couple of tries, including yeah, finishing like off that team. I would say that obviously T doesn't play uh, test rugby, you know, and there's a lot of incredibly good nines, but uh, I just admire his preparation, I admire his mentality, and I admire his humbleness. His game management is is ridiculous as well. He just seems like he can he can control the the pace of the game almost. Yeah, he's very invested in everything we do. He's a very very good person, a very deep person, a very kind person, and uh, that reflects in how he plays. He puts everyone before him, and then you know, what I mean, he can play at top speed as a nine, as a an attacker, and then he's like an extra back row for us in defence. The atmosphere at that match, Ronan, um, I, I haven't been to a La Rochelle game just yet, it's on the list, but the, the the atmosphere looked ridiculous. I think you mentioned afterwards it's not normal at all, and, and I think you compared it to, you know, I suppose in your playing days you would have played in front of raucous monster crowds and, and in Twickenham in front of 80,000 fans as well, but there just seems to be something special, and I think, as you've pointed out, like, there's a connection between the La Rochelle fans and players at the moment that that's pretty special. Yeah, it is very special, yeah, it's huge, because... Um, you know what I mean? I think we prepare all week behind closed doors, I suppose, but the energy you get then when you go to a stadium, it was um, not far off. I'd been, when I was in Super Rugby, we went to watch, uh, when we played the Aguares in Argentina, we went to watch one of the local soccer games. And the atmosphere of the local Argentinian soccer derby, it was reminiscent of that, you know what I mean? It wasn't the crowd that were sitting in their seat. There was a lot of people jumping and 40,000 people jumping at the same time creates a great atmosphere because you can obviously um, when the game is fairly well decided you can have a let your mind drift and it was powerful for um, for a long time and that's exactly what you want to do with there's uh, very very um, similar attributes between playing for Munster and Colts and La Rochelle, that's for sure, and, and the common element is the, uh, I suppose, the connection with the fans. Can I just uh, bring you back to the Carbarlo, Carbarlo try that you, uh, Shay mentioned there just before half-time? Like, it felt it is as if it summed up um, La Rochelle's performance on the day, like the pass is stick, really at ease with the unstructured, frightening pace to move from that scrum in your own 22 into the red zone, the smarts of the prop to step inside like the Exeter defence that had stepped out a little bit, the offloads from Favre, the, that offload from Soutini was off the charts. Like, the rugby was so good. And I just watched it, like, with awe and wondered how much of that was a plan and how much of it is just playing what's in front of you. Yeah, that's good. It's a good... I think we have um, established something here, Adrian, where we talked previously on the show about flow, don't we? Mm. So for me, that's exactly when you flow in your game or when you have... Uh, people secure in their ability and they're playing what they see at top speed. And it all comes together, you know, and the fact that uh, the offload, obviously, from Uja Satini, everyone will focus on that. But as you say, Red Award, his capacity not to throw a blind pass, to keep the ball, to accelerate, 
just to play it while I was in front of him. Um, and if you consider how that started, we probably had three men spare on the left hand side in the scrum, but Jules Favre kind of was aggressive in his carry, breaking tackles, and then we played offload game. Then good decision by uh, Dylan Lades to keep the ball cleaned out, but by Will Skelton, then uh, Red Ward carries Duga one man clean out. You know, we're just um, attacking with speed, attacking space, and uh, that's why uh, rugby, when it's played like that, it's very, very simple. Yes, for that to combine, you need, I suppose, a lot of um, movements or mindsets aligning. What was the most pleasing thing for you, for you about the game from a coach's point of view? Um, I think our capacity to strike back into the game, 7 0, Exeter started well. They were aggressive. They were good at how they constructed their first try. Simmons was really difficult to stop, and he got five metres from the line, so they went 7 0 up. We're at home, and uh, there has to be a moment there when you can kind of think, you know, watch, okay, this could be it. Exeter's day, but we stamped that out quite quickly and then put the foot on the accelerator and went away and went away and went further away and then put a gig, bigger gap between us and never gave them any hope, really, but until we had, uh, obviously, very disappointing switch-off late in the second half. I think you spoke afterwards, Ronan, and it was a curious one that I wanted to ask you about. You were, you were talking about the hope for a few beers and a sing-song, obviously, to celebrate, but uh, you made the point, it is to live days like today that we are in rugby. I wonder, has that changed from, from your from your playing days? Because players are, are often, they're all often operational robots at times, and they have to be. Uh, you can't really enjoy these moments when they come around, but but clearly now that you're a coach, you, you're, you seem to be in a different mindset where you can actually say, you know what, these days don't come around too often. We've got to a European final and we can actually enjoy it for what it is. Yeah, I think... I'd hope to think the players are like that more than I'm like that. You know, I think it's a player's game. They get to express themselves. I've got to set the environment for them. But um, it's very, very important that they they enjoy the know, they enjoy the prep. I wouldn't have. I would have enjoyed a winning dressing room afterwards. But, you uh, I mean, there's different ways to... To, to approach something that's why when you go around the world you see different strokes for different folks and different uh, ways of preparing and different cultures and different uh, fascinating mindsets at work so you know, Will Skelton Winnie Antonio prepare very differently to how I prepared I don't know which way is right is or better way to answer the question was is there uh, a wrong way for doing it but how I, I suppose, saw my approach as a player. Um, there wouldn't be a need for that nowadays, and everything is evolving. The most important thing is that uh, the players get to express themselves. Uh, do you allow yourself to get <clears throat> excited by the final? It's the dream final, like a repeat of last year, uh, Leinster, Dublin. Um, the dream final for who? I think for the, for the neutrals. I mean, cer- okay. certainly for, for Irish people, right? Like, you're going to have, obviously, all the Leinster supporters and then you'll have everybody else um, shouting on La Rochelle and shouting on yourself. Um, there's a huge excitement about it here. Yeah, it's hard because I'm detached from that, obviously. But, yeah, come the 20th of May, it'll be an incredibly exciting day, that's for sure. Um, dream finally added for people that have probably don't have... Um, something um, involved in it, but for for us, it's it's a it's a huge opportunity. It's a very exciting opportunity. It'll be uh, the biggest challenge we've ever faced. Um, but that's why you uh, get involved, isn't it? Th- those big those big rivalries between, say, Arsenal and Manchester United back in the day, Ronan, they were always hyped up even further by by the mind games between Wenger and Ferguson. I'm not going to call them mind games, but the um, this uh, post match interview where you're describing the the slog that that La Rochelle have to go through compared to Leinster and and I guess the competitiveness of the games in the top fourteen is that is that a I think Lindsay Pete described it as a, is a it's a good way of taking pressure off the players your own players no I don't think so I just think that's what I spoke which is I don't have anything prepared for the mind games to play Leinster you know I think it won't come down to that. Um, 
they were my views probably in the heat of battle after after uh, a semi final victory. When you sit back and you're able to analyse it, probably people playing in the URC will see a very different view to living and me playing in the top fourteen. So it is what it is. It it probably has no relevance uh, for for uh, winning on, on the twentieth. I just think that. Um, from our point of view, there would be no excuses, you know. We're going there to to, to try and uh, win the competition. And that's what it comes down to. There'd be all kinds of things thrown around in the lead-up to the game. But um, that's um, for other people to decide. You um, you had in your back pocket last year the uh, Leinster tend to... Uh, fall off if I remember correctly um, I don't know was it in the last 20 minutes or certainly towards the end of the game and I know you'd spoken a lot about that afterwards that you knew if you were still in the mix at that point that you could you know hold Leinster out and certainly looking at your defence at the weekend the number of times that you repelled from close in or even held up over the line was remarkable and obviously um, Leinster failed to do that at the end of the game last year what's the I, have you started to look at that I'm sure you had the pencil out when you were um, watching the game on Saturday um, not really, no. I was more prepped for Sunday, to be honest. You know, right. I think it would be a huge error because our season could be over Sunday dinner time. You know, if you keep your interest in the other semi final, you've already missed the jump. So uh, there will be things from that video that would be looked at. I haven't looked at it yet. Uh, maybe this afternoon might get a little bit of time. Otherwise, uh, you know, we've too long, we've Montpellier, then we've the, the final week um, to get a performance right um, for that. But Leinster are a better team than they were last year. I think we're a better team than we were last year. Thanks for a huge, compelling game. Um, but I suppose what's consistent in a lot of this is that, you know, I mean, Leinster are beating teams by 20 or 30 points, even though sometimes it feels like they're tight games. So mm. their last 16 hours, sorry, they're performance from 60 to 80 minutes I haven't looked at any of the data but uh, they finished games incredibly well so um, um, yeah it's for us to be able to um, have our plan Leinster will have their plan so it is what it is uh, it's going. It's going to be incredible. There's going to be fireworks. If they, last weekend was the basis of anything to go on. The uh, it's going to be an absolute belter. We've one in here from Greg London. Uh, he says, "Ronan, will you get onto some of the sports shops in Ireland to start looking at stocking La Rochelle jerseys uh, ahead of the final?" Mm-hmm. So th- I think that's an indication that there will be people that'll be there decked out in yellow and red. That may not be from. I know your catchment area is growing around La Rochelle, maybe not quite as wide as uh, as you would expect it, but there'll be plenty of Irish fans. I'm there. Sure, uh, I'm sure there to jury on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I sure will. Yeah, well, look, we'll get into it a bit, uh, that game a bit more specifics, maybe close to the time. Thanks, William, and congrats again. Cheers. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Thanks, Adrian. Cheers. Bye bye. Ronan Gar on the line there from uh, La Rochelle. It's just an incredible feat, like an incredible success story. <sighs> Watching the game, I watched the game in full on Wednesday night, and they are frightening. Yeah, they're, ter- they're terrifying to watch. Oh, um, the quality of. A lot of the it, there's so much reminiscent about the um, All Blacks about them with yeah. the quality of the stuff they do, the basic stuff they do, but making the ball stick, the basic skills, the heads up rugby. I'm sure like that's what we we're trying to get at there as a part of the game plan, or are you playing what's in front of you. But Jesus, frightening! Like there's somebody I was on to <coughs> a couple of Munster friends last night, and they were like, "No, no, you know, Leinster will have this sewn up in the final. Don't worry about that." And not at all. Like it's it is not going to be a surprise. In the slightest, yeah. If La Rochelle win this final, are you conflicted as a as a Leinster fan who chats to Ronan all the time? No, conf- no, not in, not in the slightest. <laughs> no shame. conflection. See, I, I'm I'm backing Ronan in this one. I'm, yeah. I'm 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 the same. I'm looking for my, my La Rochelle jersey ahead of the final. You're putting your Ulster jersey to one side for, for a minute. Sounds terrible. Look, there's a lot of Irish lads in that the Leinster team, and I wish them well, and, and I don't really it's care. It's desperate who wins the to be match. honest with you. Yeah, like I think. You're actively. If it was anybody else but uh, La Rochelle, who would you? No. Be for? Oh yeah, I'd be, I'd be for Leinster. Right. I think La Rochelle is the only. There's a lot of Irish people from outside Leinster that maybe have a little soft spot for for La Rochelle now, especially people in Munster, I suppose. Uh, it's popular to dislike Leinster. You're not wrong there, yeah. And yeah. it's just an arsehole of a trade. Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's wrong. 
How is it an arsehole of a trade to dislike it's Leinster? Just, it's I'm like not from Leinster. Snobbery, like no, I'm fr- I'm from anti Leinster. Like I know, but th- that makes it even worse. Like Why? So what if you 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 work and live in Dublin? So there's a good chance I don't you support will Dublin spend the rest of your days. I don't in, support Dublin GA. Or, but you're nobody's, and neither do I. Nobody's asking you to. Yeah, right. Well, how does geography <laughs> come into it then? Because from you're, li- you're living in Leinster. You you actually we've established before. I so living in Leinster means said, I should support. Leinster. I jokingly so, so said is geography. You, jokingly said to you about Ulster. You'd actually don't have a province, so you're a floating voter. Well, no, I, just jump on board. Do a province. I'm from Ulster, but my dad don't. You've never well, been da- to Ravenhill. My, your my, Ulster is not your. Yeah, province. Yeah, my dad's. A, I, I'd support Connacht more so because dad's from Galway. I know, but like if my auntie had whatever, she'd be well, yeah, from f- Ulster. I just but more I'm just saying, that. like. Jump on board, Chen. Don't no, be a there's, hater. A, there's a lot of people in the comments, I'm sure, that would back me up that that they're Irish be, but not a Leinster a fan. Who cares if it's if it's popular to not support Leinster? It is. It's like it's just such an arsehole of a trade. <sighs> it's not an yeah, I'm not saying you're an arsehole. You're a of course, yeah, person, yeah, yeah, a great yeah, colleague. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Respect that. Respect <clears> that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> respect. Respect. <laughs> Put respect on the name, Chen. Twenty past eight. Column is jumping out of his skin to get us moving here, and uh, so we will do the, just that. Twenty past eight. You're watching OTBAM, and uh, as you know by now, we are live every morning. Which let labs get the ultimate shave or your money back. Me on night edition is available now. We also have a very special UEFA Champions League roadshow live. Uh, during the week in Dublin it was at the Mansion House and it was all in association with Just Eat during the ads you're going to hear a snippet from John O'Shea and Wes Brown that were in conversation with Joan Nathan uh, keep an eye out uh, over the coming days by the way a good long sections of that are available on YouTube and the full show will be available on our podcast network and across all of our social channels keep an eye out for that and we're back after the break talking WSL OTB AM The Sports Breakfast Show from Off The Ball off the ball Crazy numbers It's like you know People playing football manager Championship manager When they were younger It's like cheat code stuff I mean, have these players Who like They've been rigged To be excessively good at Playing 20 something games And having more goals Than appearances But the Haaland stuff Is sort of uh, Other scary stats We haven't even met Robbie Keane Like I, I thought There's left field A shot And shout As I've, I remember Like I did not have Robbie Keane in my Sam Aradici bingo for he's going to be the guy in the touchline. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. This is a real sign of the times question, but Wes, when you broke into the first team, mm. you were still getting the bus to training. Correct, yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, I started probably training with the first team at 17. So that was, that was uh, 97, 98. Um, Get the bus to training, bus to the games, hold my boots. But that was, it was normal then. I know people look, might go, that just wouldn't happen now because it wouldn't. It probably wouldn't be safe. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we used to do. And I remember you always used to get off, the, the bus wouldn't take you all the way to the cliff and I used to get off and just hold. The, M, the M10. Yeah, the M10, that's the, the one M10. from Piccadilly. And just hope one of the lads in the cars would pick me up. And, hey, a few of them drove past a few times as well. <laughs> It was normally like Nicky Butt. Nicky Butt or Andy Cole, because it was about the same time the bus come, they always come at the, in the, at the same time. But yeah, pretty much um, the bus every day until I didn't anymore. So. Yeah. And did anyone say to you, you need to stop getting the bus? Yeah, I mean, the gaffer got me in one day. <laughs> oh. It's a true story again. And unfortunately, I had a fight on the bus for obvious reasons. Um, but the gaffer, for some reason, didn't know I got the biff, the bus. <laughs> for whatever reason, and he said, what the, F, what the hell are you doing getting a bus? Like, what's going on? Stop getting a bus when you're going out. I said, I was like, I wasn't out. I was coming to training. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, I get the bus. And he goes, what are you getting a bus for? Get a taxi. <laughs> and I said, I would get a taxi, but I can't afford a taxi. And I remember going through how much everything was. Um, and I think at the time, it was on about £250 a week. And I'd have no money left if I got a taxi. So anyway, I got out of the fight because he was just looking up in the air thinking, Jesus, <laughs> okay, we'll get you a new contract and that's pretty much <laughs> <laughs> what that happened there. Tactic. That old well, tactic. Well, the true story. <laughs> true story. OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. 24 minutes past 8 you're watching OTP AM do keep the comments coming into us whether it's about shirts or uh, about the football or the rugby do keep the comments coming into us over the course we're with you between now and 10 o'clock and Kathleen McNamee is with us in the studio Kathleen good morning to you morning guys we have the fire pit coming up later on that I believe might uh, actually catch fire properly oh, 
Hopefully, anyways. Yeah, that's we'll, it. We'll taunt people with that little bit. <laughs> we'll hold off on that uh, for now. Um, just loads to get to. Um, we might come to Gianni Infantino and just a little bit in the uh, comments that he's had to make again during the week. Uh, we might just talk about first of all about Sam Kerr digging Chelsea out of it again on Wednesday night. Um, half full of chances for Chelsea. They were still five minutes uh, to go in the game and still just hanging on and uh, she benefits from one off the post. Um, fourth title in a row though feels uh, mathematically certainly in their um, grasp and feels the mom- that little momentum swing and the importance of that goal, Kathleen? Yeah, it seems a bit inevitable at this stage. I think this is what Chelsea have been so good at doing all season is not performing all that well on the pitch for like the entire 90 minutes and then Sam Kerr pops up in the last like five, ten minutes grabs a goal and all of a sudden they've won the game and they're flying it. I think for them, the last couple of weeks have been rough. Obviously, they had the Champions League and bowing out of that, but also just in terms of the amount of injuries that the, is in the squad. You know, they've been playing without players like Penilla Harder, Frank Kirby, Millie Bright, like all their big names for a lot of the season. Um, so for Emma Hayes, it's impressive. I kind of feel, though, she's at the stage where she would probably have given up the WSL title if it meant going that little bit further in the Champions League. Um, She's a bit like Pep Guardiola in that sense. It's kind of her, the one that keeps getting away from her. Um, But yeah, Liverpool were good on Wednesday night. Mm. I feel like with the bank holiday, I'm losing track of like what day of the week it was. Liverpool were good. (coughs) Yeah, Uh, Kind of, they've been a frustrating side this season because... They obviously have done very well as a team that's just like come up, especially again with the injuries that they've had to the players like Leanne Kiernan. Like they haven't really had that one person that's their out and out striker that can actually take the shots for them. But you know they go into some games and they lose six nil, and then they go up against a team like Chelsea and they come away with one lo- one win and then a very narrow two one loss. Mm. Pretty impressive though from Liverpool's perspective, like the the, the fact that they can come into the WSL and potentially finish in the top half. Like the job that Matt Beard has done is pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah, it definitely is, and I think Liverpool are one of those sides that were, Matt Beard is very clever about how he constructs a team. So, say like bringing in a player like Shanice Van der Sanden, who is like Dutch international, has insane experience across like multiple leagues. Every time she plays, Liverpool automatically look a lot, lot better. And I think the challenge for him will be bringing in those younger players that he can train up, but also attracting more of those sort of bigger names. A bit unfortunate, she's kind of not played a lot of minutes just because of injury, um, but they just look like a much more stable team when she's in it. And I think she's been pretty crucial for them this season. I think as well, it's good to see like teams coming up from the championship and actually performing better than a lot of the other teams. Because a lot of the time, it's the team comes up goes down quite quickly or else doesn't go down the first year, goes down the next year. Um, whereas I don't really see that being the case with Liverpool. I think they've built enough of a foundation in the league this year that they can kick on next season. And they'll have a bit of a say. We chatted to Gilly Flaherty a couple of weeks ago about the say that Everton might have in the run-in and uh, the importance of the games against the better teams that were playing. It's a bit of that with Liverpool, including City, uh, this weekend. Um, but we don't really care about Liverpool. They're sort of in limbo in the middle of the table, uh, which, which in itself, as we've established, is success. But what we do care about is the fact that some of their players um, who, you know, we will have an interest in later in the year are coming back to fitness. Leanne Kiernan getting close to coming back. There was chat that she might have been involved during the week, but she could even be back uh, for this weekend. Neve Fahey, Fahey getting back, Megan Campbell getting back training. Um, these are important weeks now from an Ireland point of view. Yeah, really important. And very important for the players too, because you look at, say, like Neve is a dead set for the World Cup if she's fit. Even if she's like slightly carrying something I still think Vera Powell is going to bring her uh, for Leanne Vera has this weird thing against Leanne Kieran and I, I've never really understood it because like Leanne in the league is very good at getting goals and before she got injured she looked like she was going to you know be competing for a golden boot with some of the chances that she was getting uh, but for some reason Vera doesn't like her doesn't feel like she plays into her system so this season was going to be really really important for her in terms of getting game time proving herself and she's kind of against the clock now. Like, there is only a couple of games left in the season. Um, like, she would kind of want to be coming in, I would think, this weekend to start proving herself, especially since Vera had a bit of a set against her before. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would love to see her do it because I think, like, Leanne's a great player. She's been so unlucky. I feel like this is just the theme of the morning, me being like, injuries, injuries, injuries. Mm-hmm. She's been so unlucky with injuries over the year. Like, we talked 
to her on Koi Gig. Um, it was like one of the first few episodes that we did. And she was talking about, you know, the mental battle she's had to pull herself through over the last couple of years. Because it's like every time she gets going, something else happens or there's another setback. You know, she was supposed to be back from this injury months ago and she just kept getting setback after setback. So a very resilient player. And I feel like if anyone was to come on and make an impression. I definitely think she has it in her. Uh, I just really hope that if this season isn't to be and if the World Cup isn't to be for her, that she can kick on when the new season starts up and prove that she is that player that can get goals for Ireland, which we still desperately need. Yeah, because uh, the system thing you can sort of buy happens all the, team with, all the time with teams where you're like, this player needs to be playing, but the manager's like, no, it doesn't quite fit my uh, system. I remember in the Colin Bell days with Ireland as well, she would get regular game time there, but the system never suited her. She tended to play up front on her own, which is definitely, you know, a hard role to play for somebody who's not especially a physical player, obviously. Um, and... Yeah, I don't know. She seems like such a good person. <laughs> I just actually hope that at some point the injuries stop, the bloody system thing gets right, she gets into the World Cup squad and proves that she can do for Ireland um, what she's been doing for Liverpool. We'll watch this space. Can I reverse slightly into the Chelsea stuff and it maybe ties in a little bit with Arsenal as well because I've been asked to prompt slash goad you here about um, Arsenal's chances of winning the Premier League, which I hadn't even got on my agenda for this morning, Kathleen, I'm not going to lie. Um, but the, the Chelsea bit and um, the heartbreak of the Barcelona uh, stuff Emma Hayes was talking during the week about the impact that that would have and also conversely her confidence in their ability to get the results that they'd need um, in the run-in and I wondered in the context of the Liverpool game whether their inability to put the game away for so long despite all the chances they had created should give United and City and I mean if you want to include Arsenal in that conversation Kathleen you feel free to do that uh, should give United and City hope or is it the the opposite that actually some of those chances are just going to come off and they're going to end up blitzing teams uh, between now and the run-in? Um, I think the crucial games are going to be the weekend where the two Manchester teams play and the two London teams play. I think that's going to be what actually decides the t- A, the title, and B, the Champions League places. I think Emma Hayes has got this Chelsea team in such a space where even though they went out of the Champions League and it was disappointing, they actually did put up a performance in the Camp Nou, which is like no one does that so like Emma Hayes is the sort of person that's going to take that and be like well we went to the Dragon's Den and okay we didn't slay them but we came pretty close to it this is going the rest of the season is nothing to us because we can do that against some of the world's best so Mm. I think for her she is always like player management has always been one of her strong suits and I think that's what's going to come in in the next couple of weeks I mean she has already had to deal with intense pressure this season. And I think that when you look at the players that are hopefully coming back for them as well, you know, like Disha Buchanan and Millie Bright should be back for some of the last games of the season all going well. Um, Her injury was she just had her knee cleaned out, so it's not as serious as some of the other ones that we've seen. I think that she... Chelsea are just this juggernaut, and they have this mentality that no matter... Until that final whistle goes there is always a chance that Sam Kerr can get a header or, you know, someone will pop up and get a goal. And they have, even though all their younger players are maybe not the sort of bigger names that a lot of people who don't watch the WSL all the time or maybe who just tune into international football don't recognise, they're still incredibly good. It's not like Arsenal against Wolfsburg where we had a bench of teenagers that no one had ever heard of. They were players that were kind of coming from relative oblivion, whereas... Chelsea's bench of teenagers are like these are the top young stars from across the world who have like won Heinemann trophies over in the US or you know won all the big things across the world so I think for Chelsea they just have that experience they have the depth and they have that knowledge as well of what they need to do because they, they've been in this position before many many times so they, they know where they're at I wonder is there um like you talk about the young players, but obviously their chase of an older head in the last transfer window caught a lot of the headlines. Is that inevitable that McCabe, I know it's disappeared off the agenda as a talking point, but like I, it's the thing that I think about all the time when I watch Katie McCabe or I'm watching Chelsea, how would they be with Katie McCabe and the team? Is it is it accepted that that's inevitable, that that's going to happen in the summer or off? I don't think it's accepted as inev- inevitable at all. Um I mean, that came relatively out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, 
there was some joking about it around the Irish camp whenever they were over in Marbella and we were chatting to them and there was just lots of eye rolls from Katie every time it was brought up. I don't, it depends. I think like if, if she wants Champions League football and Arsenal don't get it this season, then maybe a move might be on. But also I think she has an intense loyalty to the club and I think it would take more than one season out of the Champions League for her to turn her head. I imagine, I, I kind of feel like for her, not so much it would be playing with Chelsea. It would be more an opportunity to go somewhere else and maybe experience a different league or a different style of football. I would be very surprised if she ended up at Chelsea, to be honest. It's never been an inevitability in my head, and maybe that is just me praying and hoping that my she little heart doesn't Arsenal. get broken. <laughs> uh, she can go anywhere else if she goes to Chelsea. It'll <laughs> be like Fabregas leaving Arsenal or something. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think she seems happy where she is, and she has a very important role in that Arsenal squad. And she's squad. been given the captaincy recently. and Yeah, yeah. and like the chances... Well, if Kim Little hopefully comes back and is fine for the start of the next season, she'll take over the captain's armband again. But like, you know, Katie kind of is the inevitable person in that lineage. Um, so I think for now, there's no signs of her moving, but who knows? I mean, a lot of players talk about how incredible Emma Hayes is to work for. So if she decides that's something she wants to experience, then off she may go. I know we don't want to make this the, the injury slot, uh, Kathleen at all, but... Um Laura Wienreuther, I mean, the fourth Arsenal player, I think it is, to suffer an ACL injury this season. Um, the others being Williamson, Beth Mead and, and Miedema. Mm. This is this is becoming an, an ep- epidemic in, in women's football. Yeah, as uh, Vivian Miedema said on her Instagram post, the ACL Arsenal club is now closed. <laughs> so uh, no more entries, please. No, it is. It, and I, I know it seems, because Arsenal have had four in the last six months, it seems very intense, but I was actually reading through a couple of things on Twitter and people were pointing out, or like, Leon, when they won the Champions League last year, they also had three ACLs that had also happened in the previous 12 months or something, so it's not unusual at all. Um, and there's this ongoing thing of, well, what is... Is it Arsenal? Like, is there something going on there? The club is doing an inquest into it at the moment, trying to work out, you know, are they doing something wrong? Are we not utilising the research that is there well enough yet? Or are we still, you know, trying to find the actual root cause of this in the right way? Uh, So it needs to be worked out. You look at the list of players that are out. It's insane. Every time, like, when Fiend Rutter went down the other day, I automatically knew it was an ACL injury. Like, you just... She was barely touched, the way her knee slipped, and the minute she went, hit the ground, her arm went into the air. And every time you see that, you're just like, oh, it's another one. Um, so yeah, I think as much as Jen Beatty put it really well, she was like, I don't think my generation of footballers is going to benefit from any of this right now. If, on, if anything, these players are the guinea pigs. And we, it's going to be the next generation, hopefully, benefit from the fact that there are so many now and so much attention is on it and people are actually looking at okay how how do we stop this the uh, two games to keep an eye out for this weekend united spurs and city liverpool let's just assume they go with form and um we will discuss that in more detail than that one thing that i want to ask you about uh, Catherine, before we wrap is just about uh women football women's football football's greatest advocate uh, Gianni Infantino has been uh, out this week and um, I'm sure people saw it but batting on behalf of the game uh, by saying that some domestic broadcasters need to pay more for rights and I was interested in the comments of Moya Dodd who's not only a former Australia player but maybe more importantly than that in this context next FIFA council member and uh, said that his comments were outrageous she said the FIFA have long established uh, the rights as worthless and prize money wasn't a priority for FIFA previously around the women's game yeah Moya's great um, she's such an advocate for women's football in general. Um, and Infantino, I think, I mean, a lot of stuff that Infantino says backfires on him. That we're used to that. But he was trying to make this point of, you know, oh, you guys aren't valuing women's football and you're terrible. And because of that, you're not going to get to watch any football. And everyone was like, if you're trying to promote your tournament and get more eyes on it, like one billion people watched the last World Cup, why would you do a blackout? It makes absolutely no sense. No sense. And like the amount of money that FIFA roll in, it it's not going to make a difference to their pocket how much any of the countries pay for the broadcast rights. And you're like, yes, the product should be valued, 
but the way he's gone about this just makes absolutely zero sense. FIFA have never cared about women's football. They continue to show they don't care about it every single day with like the prize money for the tournament. You know, he's given off about what people are paying for broadcast rights and you look at the prize pot for the tournament compared to the men's tournament and you're like, well, mm. did we not see a little bit of an issue there somewhere, Infantino? Um, so yeah, I'm, I don't know, he... He's a madman in my head and I saw those comments and I was like, loads of people are going to talk about this and in a way no one really comes out well of it. Mm -hmm. Infantino doesn't come out well of it. I don't think the broadcasters look particularly good that some of them are putting in offers as low as like a couple of million for the rights. You know, I know it's not peak times in Europe but it's still a World Cup. People are going to watch it. Yeah, I think the the point that he's making is actually valid. It's just the place where the point is coming from, I think, is kind of the issue here, isn't it? And like the lack of assurance about if that extra money, where does that extra money go when it does come in, I think is a long established question around that organisation. Kathleen, uh, enjoyed that. Thanks a million. Thank you, guys. 8.40, you're watching OTBM with uh, Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night edition available now. I'm going to read some comments, but before that, we'll welcome Alan Quinlan to the show. Quinny, how are you getting on? Very good, Adrian, yourself. Uh, I've, got, I've got one in particular here, <laughs> yeah. Adrian, for you. And this is coming up the same street as yourself. I'm interested to get Quinny's views on this as well. This is the, the silliest comment of the morning, right? From Super Saturday. So Shane will support these players when playing for Ireland, but will cheer for a foreign team when they are playing against Irish players in blue. So we were discussing earlier that on is who would ridiculous. people outside of Leinster be supporting. Why would I support Champions Leinster? Cup final? I want Irish. Why would I support Leinster? I don't uh, know. I can't tell you what you should or ever, shouldn't do. Adrian was telling me it's, popu it's populist to, to, to support against Leinster. Of course it is. Yeah, so but, would, you, but would you agree with that? That doesn't mean I don't. Popular I, to that be mean I support them. when you're not well, from outside Leinster. People don't like them. When you when you yeah, isn't that true? I, I wouldn't say people don't like him. I'd say not a not a. <laughs> probably Come on now, don't be walking a little bit. Don't and be probably walking say in. that. Um, they probably outside of outside of Leinster. The sneeriness at Leinster because. But you're a Connacht man, really. Yeah, so. Regardless yeah. of that, there there is a there's a dislike for Leinster, and it was there before they before they started winning stuff. It's called sport. Why, why, why would Liverpool fans support Man United if they if United were? I'm better were off to stay out of this. You just argue away well, like, there. So say say um, biggest rival. So say West. Who's Westmead's biggest rival? Traditionally, Meath. Yeah. So say Westmead. They Meath, wouldn't see it that way. Say Meath yeah. beat Westmead in a in a Leinster semi final. Do, do you expect all the Westmead fans just, to go I, and support Meath in the final? We need to be careful with the comparisons because they're different. Like so, I, I'll ask you, Liverpool United. I'm not so sure that the comparisons hold. People, uh, you know, I saw Gary Neville in the last season, you know, tweeting stuff after matches and stuff when Liverpool were beaten when they lost the Champions mm. Cup final, the league, all that kind of stuff when they lost matches this year. And I was just thinking, if I'm in that same position, if I was doing that, God, I, I wouldn't do that. But he doesn't really care. And then someone asked him before, like, you know, do you want to see Liverpool win? And he was like, what do you mean? I think, Even a fair, Europe, I think a fairer you know I mean? comparison is if Munster, Connacht or Ulster were in the Champions Cup final would yeah, Leinster be supporting them? Correct. Absolutely. But ordinarily I would support Leinster in Europe but it's, because, it's, it's, it's only because it's Raj and La Rochelle. Yeah. I w if, if Leinster were playing Exeter uh, in the Champions Cup final I'd be supporting Yeah but that's Leinster. only because you, you know, if they were playing another French team well, <laughs> no, Anybody but, versus an English team Shane will you understand? Well of course that? yeah but but it's Raj, that's that's the reason. I don't want people to think I'm anti-Leinster or anyone um, from outside Leinster is anti-Leinster. Uh, Celtic says, people hate Leinster because of Dublin infer inferior complex laughing emoji, but will cheer on the same players at the World Cup. But you were saying I should support Leinster because I live in Dublin and work in Dublin. Yeah. But it's, that's, that's so it's stupid. It's really interesting about the one you don't with Ireland. You don't even have a problem. It's like the one with, the, with Ireland, and I've had this with some of my friends who wouldn't, who maybe mightn't like to see Leinster winning. But they would cheer him on then for Ireland yeah. and vice versa. There's Leinster supporters. You know, I, I wasn't very popular when I was playing for Munster against Leinster. <laughs> I might have been a bit of a divil on the field or whatever at times and annoyed people. Um, but it might have been Quinny. Might have then been, if yeah. I played for Ireland maybe and I was at a World Cup in Australia and like loads of people yeah. from Dublin were coming up, you know, wishing me well and all that. So it does change. And I, and I agree with you. It's just sport. If... You don't, you, you know, if you're ingrained into that game on Saturday, if neutrals, Leinster and La Rochelle, and are passionately glued to it and going to the match, that's a bit different. But you know, wanting another team to win over an Irish thing, I think it's focusing in on that is is a little bit childish in a sense that oh God, like some people just support different teams. The reason you're you're suggesting is yeah because it's kind of a bit of Dublin bias and Leinster bias yeah. and stuff like that. When you're successful like that, um, that's something that they had 
when we were playing like this, this maybe di not dislike from in in such, but the perception that it was D four and it yeah. was it was welts That's and it was schools. So it is still a little bit there. The perception, of but it. in fairness, Michael Check had changed a lot of that and started that process. Mick Dawson did a wonderful job there and um, I think you know, they it, I branched think out didn't they into the community that and was I think really that people, important for Leinster there are people who still have that sort of anti-D4 thing but they're just choosing to see that and nothing else no but 95% of Munster Probably. fans want La Rochelle to win the Champions Cup that's game. because sorry that's probably regard. being conservative but uh, what I'm saying is if they were playing it's also, because it's, team, it's also because it's Leinster that's, that's my look, point if, I, the Ronan Garrett thing I get but there's nothing wrong yeah, with that but look if you why would if Munster support honestly, Leinster because Leinster would support there's Munster there's probably more wouldn't though. Uh, there's probably more Leinster people that would would, would have supported Munster in 06 and 08 but there were the full on ones who no no I don't mean even the full on ones the Leinster supporters that time would have gone oh god I'd like to see exactly. they weren't ingrained in the rivalry or they weren't probably as much as 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 there is now, um, I remember Sir Drico was asked in 06, you know, um, you know, where will you watch the final or did you watch the final? And he said, I didn't. I was gone away and yeah. I wouldn't watch it. Like so, you yeah. you don't expect Drico at that time to say, well, I want to see Munster no, win. No, but there's a difference. We've just beat him in a final. Actively player. cheering against their yeah, home. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's there. The that's, that there. I, that's there. That's there. The, the um, Ronan Garrett thing. I think you can remove from the conversation because I totally accept that. That's, that's just sport. Absolutely fine. Why wouldn't but they actively support but against? It's, them? it's the it's if they're playing some other random team that they've no connection with but they're just actively it's the difference between that and actively cheering against Leinster which I think is a huge part even looking at the comments this morning is a big part that's of, just sport uh, though another one says I could never be against an Irish team in a major competition I think that's uh, that's sort of it for me that's I don't know it's, it's people are, are some are, people say that though and I'm not sure they mean it do you know what I mean I, I you know cheer on the Irish team and stuff I don't tell know you now, if, if Munster were in the final true. I'd be hoping they'd, that they'd win it this this idea yeah, yeah that's and I believe you I genuinely yeah. believe you even as as you know I'm trying to make, turn you into a Connacht man and claim <laughs> that you are that. Connacht but you're you're sticking to the Leinster the bl the blue of Leinster but I believe you and there's lots of people like that when we played we would go to Kilkenny a lot Mick Galway lived yeah. there John Hayes and myself used to go down there a lot um, and a lot of the Kilkenny fellas Ian Dowling was playing they were all Munster fans but if you went down to Kilkenny now and that group of fellas are gone older that we used to know. There's, I'm sure they're all Leinster fans. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's changed. Exactly, yeah. So that's what Leinster did really well. In fairness, they realised we need to get outside of this yeah. perception. It's still hanging in there, the school system, all that. Um, but they've definitely branched out, and and you know, Tyke Furlong and Wexford, Sean O'Brien and Tullo, Taylor all Dars, that stuff. Mayo, Robbie Henshaw, yeah. uh, Jack Conan, all the yeah. Aussies slash New Zealand. Like it's actually less and less when you. When you, if you're choosing to just see a group from D4, then you're just blind to what's a, Pe blind to the reality. people saying to me, oh, headquarters, though, they're probably looking at this is where it, you I don't know, think headquarters look, is actually officially anyway, in D4. I know, I know. I've heard the argument said to me, oh, if, if, if Leinster win on the 20th of May, that could, that could have a roll on effect in terms of Ireland in the World Cup. Winning is a, is a habit. That's a ridiculous argument. The result on the 20th of May is not going to dictate who wins I think the World be no Cup. Harm. I don't think so. If Leinster lose on the 20th of May, it, it certainly it's completely would be better if they won than if they lost. Sure, no English team won the Champions Cup in, in or the Heineken Cup I in know, 03. I know, but I'm just saying, it would, it, if you were to say it was like 0.5% of a difference. Whatever, like, I'm like, going like, to sit back here <laughs> and let you add it, lads. Like, uh, there was ridiculous. one here that I wanted to read uh, from Stevie Durfel. Uh, says it's just rivalry, nothing more, nothing less. Asking a Monster fan to support Leinster or verse, vice versa is like asking Man United fan to support Man City. So I'm sort of. I do that agree that more right. more Leinster fans would probably support Monster. That's that's a fact yeah. than Monster yeah. fans supporting. Yeah. yeah. I, I, uh, on the basis of what you saw last weekend, who's going to win it? Who do I think will win it, and who's going to win it are probably two different things. For a reason of La Rochelle can. You know they're such a powerful side, yeah. and the if they, you know, kind is, of is it an if anymore power. with them, Quinny? Just because you watch them week in week no, out, they're a very good side. They're a very good side, so La Rochelle, and 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 um, mm. but you know the reality is Leinster are going to be firm favourites, and it's going to take an extraordinary performance from from La Rochelle, which they're capable of. Mm. Um, Reminds of me of the them. conversation we were having last year, this time last year. Yeah, and. To be honest, that that Len Leinster were in control in that second half until they made a couple of mistakes and La Rochelle got a sniff, got back into it. The Bougary try in the corner from the mall when the ball should have been cleared, that gave them an, an, an invite back into it. And, you know, Leinster had a few opportunities, line breaks in that second half that it could have sealed the deal, you know. Mm. Um, 
So it's just hard to see beyond Leinster the way they're playing, um, their their accuracy around everything they're doing. There's very few teams, uh, probably no team you could take your out half, your centre and winger out of the team and kind of seamlessly just... So we know about their strength and depth and um, their forward pack, just their accuracy around everything they're doing, their Are we their reading too position. much into the, <clears throat> into the Toulouse game, Quinny, in that regard, in the sense that, like, there was definitely... I'm not saying they entirely shot themselves on the foot, but they definitely took a toe off by their decision around Dupont to lose. It didn't help them, but... And I wouldn't get carried away too much. I think they did the job really, really well and they just looked like changing gears when, you know, Toulouse's discipline was poor. Once you nearly beat Toulouse over in Toulouse, mm. if they had an extra little bit of firepower, they deserved to win that game. I think Toulouse, the Sharks, for 50 minutes of the... Was it the round 16 game or the quarterfinal? I can't remember. when the, In Europe, mm. the Sharks were cutting Toulouse open. We know how good they can be with the X factor and when they come alive and the offloads start happening, but cup rugby is is kind of different and I think And La Rochelle are different. Like you watch the They're a bit they're more of a pragmatic, yeah. They can kind hold of, teams out from yeah, the, yeah. I'm not saying at their ease, but with certainly with regularity yeah. from five yards out, they can hold them up over the line, they can force a penalty. Very unusual in rugby these days to see that. Nearly like when the team is five yards out, you nearly think yeah, well, they're getting over. And, and the difference with Europe like this and La Rochelle is they, they're a cup team as well um, as regards they know probably through Rog and changing the mentality of of how to control the tempo of a game and, and you know not to get overly frustrated with you know Toulouse got frustrated last week they started f- firing the ball around and kicking loosely and um, the discipline was really poor. Lens were on a different level, to be fair. And it's their overall package. Like, it's everything they do. Um, the offloads, defenders beaten, um, you know, holding on to possession, the lines are running, all that stuff is superb. And then, you know, I, I just think Gibson Park, and I think he's so important to Ireland as well, he's so important to that Leinster side. He's decision-making, he's passing, he's timing a pass. Wonderful player. Um, but yeah. then there's so many good players right across the board that they're all at a very high level and when they when they get going you know they all react um, the anticipation around what everybody's doing if somebody gets a half gap they're, they're on it you know so who'll win it I don't know I think on paper you think yeah and on form throughout Europe this year Leinster have been such at such a high level um, I think it's 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 Leinster that'll win it mm. Um I think obviously La Rochelle and you know a couple of weeks to prepare for it how Ronan manages his squad um, there'll be a big La Rochelle crowd will come they're, they're, they'll, they'll support him there Cork. Uh, yeah maybe <laughs> uh, but they're incredible travelling support as well they so um, and the scenes they had last year was, was phenomenal Leinster owed them one so it's going to be really intriguing yeah. in a few weeks but I think Leinster at the moment yeah you think will well, uh, it'll be too hard to beat them at home. It's uh, uh, Shell are frightening at their pomp as well. Let's talk a little bit about the URC quarterfinals. Obviously, they uh, kick off tonight. Ulster Connacht this evening. Stormer Bulls tomorrow at half two. Leinster Sharks tomorrow at five. And then Glasgow Munster tomorrow at 7.35. So, a lot of the big hitters back, especially at Raven Hill tonight. You look at Bundy, Hansen, Herring, Tamang Allen and McCluskey uh, across both teams back and more as well. What's your um, sense of how this one goes? Um, Connacht have been... Their form and their winning run, winning run came to an end the last day against against Glasgow, um, which was understandable. It was always going to be a really difficult game for them getting into Europe and the playoffs um, was a, a massive uh, boost for them. Um, given the start of the season, if you remember back, Ulster round one away thirty six ten Ulster. Then they went to the Stormers and Bulls, got well beaten in both those games. Mm. So there were three losses from the first three rounds uh, on the back foot. Then they responded, they beat Munster in in in, in, uh, in the sports ground, the 4G pitch, that was the first game in it. Mm. Um, and then they were very much up and down right up to Christmas, through the Christmas period. And then they you know, went on a run where they beat the Sharks, the Lions, which you'd expect, there were two home games against the South Africans. One away in Zebra, 57-34, and they started this run and suddenly you started to think if they, 
their run isn't as bad. Bar the Glasgow one, the run in wasn't as bad. You know, they went to the Dragons during the Six Nations, beat them 22 20, which was a bit of a slog. Very impressive against Edinburgh, 41 26, um, and Cardiff, 38 19. And then, as I said, the last game. So they went in a run of six wins in the URC, which put them in this position. Um, playing the exciting brand, the offloading, the running, the passing, width in their game. Um, so they're in better fettle, obviously, because they're coming off a better run. Ulster had a didn't have the most difficult run in either, um, and obviously you've got to compliment them finishing second in the league. They had a period there, if you remember December, January, which was dreadful. Um, the run they had in the league and in Europe, um, but so it's a hard one to call. I think you know, obviously it being in 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 Belfast. It's difficult. Bit of pressure on McFarland, bizarrely. For I mean, as many yeah. Well, you see, if there. yeah, they, it is. And if Connacht were to to kind of get something and win this game, I think Ulster kind of peter out again mm. at this stage. Um, you know, if they win, beat Connacht, they're going to be at home in a semi final as well. So they have a path to the final. Um, and with Leinster's distractions in Europe, it might help them actually give them a sniff at winning it. So it's an intriguing one, I think. Um, Bundyaki and Mac Hansen being back and Dave Heffernan is, is a big boost for Connacht um, and they're a dangerous side when you look at that back line Caelan Blade is someone who's a lot to play for as well mm. given the fact that um, you know he's been in Andy Farrell's squads he's not a million miles away um, very good player um, so it's 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 a big yeah. game. Someone I'd look at in the Ulster side that I'd love to see go well is, is, is um, Jacob Stockdale um, to try and fight his way back into this Irish, mm. um, you know, reckoning. But, you know, he, they need a good run between now and the end of the season. There's a number of the Ulster players, you know, Dwayne Vermeulen could be his last game if they're beating Rory Sutherland. Um, Ulster's mall has been very strong this season. So I would say if Connacht can deal with Ulster's mall, they have a r real chance here because I think, you know, they are going to throw the ball around a bit and have a real go here. Um, so it's an intriguing one, but you probably have to fancy Ulster, but I think Old Connacht, are, they have a real chance going there tonight. We'll skip by the uh, the Leinster game and go to tomorrow evening um, in Scotstown. The game last month as a barometer at the 28-0 at half time. We'll skip the Leinster one just because it's... A f a no, I'm not four. saying that at all. I'm oh, not we don't have that. time for they, it. They I know are, that. to yeah. be fair. Yeah. We don't know what Sharks, team. And to the be Sharks fair, are without um, two of their biggest names the two of the biggest names of world rugby um, so I don't know but with Khaleesi yeah, yeah and, but, um, Mo but Munster like uh, Sneeman is back potentially yeah Jack we don't Martin know the teams Leinster Sharks they're either back, they're we back training so, I mean, if, those, if those who were included well Sneeman is going to be back and I think he'll start what we saw from him a few a few weeks ago when he came back the first game back down in Cork um, I can't think what game that was three or four weeks ago yeah. he's, he's yeah, returned he came game. off the bench I think um yeah, that was um, that. It he looked a little bit slow, yeah. pedestrian, nervous, which is understanding uh, and understandable. There was a Scarlets game. Then they had Glasgow, um, their next game, which they lost. Uh, he came off the bench there again. The Stormers game was the one where I saw him having that little bit of spark back in him. Mm -hmm. And he's look, he's a phenomenal player. I yeah. honest to God, Fair he's enough. standing beside him, he's he's just a monster. So he's a huge boost for them. Tigburn being back in the mix. I don't know whether they'll probably not start him because he hasn't played since the French game. It's been a long time. But having a Tigburn off the bench for twenty minutes or twenty five minutes of that second half would be significant. Niall Scannell's back in the mix, Dave Kilcoyne, Roman Salanoa. And I think that could be key for Munster here is to try and uh, have that impact off the bench. But they're going to a side who, um, they're very, very dangerous. You know, Tupelo on the centre, Hugh Jones, Stafford McDowell, um, Ali Price. You start rattling them off. Yeah. The, the the back row of <laughs> Fagerson, um, Rory Darge, you know, Richie Gray. Scott Cummings, Fagerson, all these fellas, and they caused Munster a, a lot, huge amount of problems in that game in Thomond Park a few weeks back. Uh, breakdown was an issue, lineup was an issue, and scrum was an issue. Very difficult to. They have a bonus point wrapped up before half time, so you feel there's going to be a spark from Munster, obviously because it's a it's a knockout game, 
but they've got to play well as well bringing emotion and fire to, to Glasgow tomorrow well, that's not going to be enough it, no they've got to play well and they've got to perform uh, the fight is not going to just get you the result but I think they're in a better position will they get the result it's going to be very tight um, I think I, I want to believe yeah and I believe they'll be close to it um, but Glasgow are a very dangerous side and they're, they're, they've been playing well um, you know for the last number of months they're, they're in a the only thing that may distract them a little bit is they have a Challenge Cup final in two weeks and yeah. um, it's a real win opportunity playing Toulon here in Dublin I think it'll suit Glasgow better um, but you know, they're full of confidence and belief and that's what two Pilotos, uh, Sione two Piloto so in the centre yeah. is saying that they feel really confident. So it's an intriguing one. If Munster Scrum and line out don't function and they get kind of issues. I think they had a night off for that first half mm. and were caught by a really powerful side and full of internationals. So um, they have a real good chance. I'm not sure who's going to win this one. It's going to be Sorry, very tight. Yeah, yeah. All right. A uh, couple of comments before we leave this to bring us full circle. Embarrassing for Irish fans to support a French team over an Irish club, says HC. Why? Why? Quinny is right, says Edward Freeman. Leinster fans would support other provinces, but Munster fans less likely to. It's easier for them as they've been beaten down by Munster so much it's not even a real rivalry anymore, which is a whole other kettle of fish. Alela Raj, says Kieran O'Connor. Um... <laughs> Bum, bada, bum. Alela Raj, I agree with that comment. Dahi O'Shaughnessy says, 95% of Munster fans supporting Leinster. Ah, Shane, that's a big stretch. Can't remember you saying that, but... Uh, I did say that, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, it's a big stretch that 95% of Munster fans will be supporting La Rochelle in the... 95% of fans. fans will be supporting La Rochelle is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Of course they will. Uh, yeah, sorry, he was saying that the, the, he misinterpreted what you said, which definitely... Um, All right, yeah. yeah. Uh, Aaron Ver says, um, lived in France and played amateur rugby there. I would never support a French or any other club over an Irish one. As a proud Connacht man, I support Leinster wholeheartedly. Allez le bleu. Shane, Selick says, says uh, Shane, Shane is shook. Someone says, uh, not a, well, not shook right. at all. He's rattled. As a proud rattled Connacht man, you're supporting Leinster. Vive la Rochelle, vive Raj. Uh, do keep those comments coming into us, Quinny. Thanks a million. Enjoy the rugby over the weekend. We'll chat to you next week. Uh, right, where are we off to now? We have the fire pit standing by. It's OTB AM. We're live at Gillette Labs. The uh, get the ultimate shaver. Your money back. Neon night edition is available now. The fire pit is coming up. But first of all, Manchester United and the Republic of Ireland's Aoife Mannion was chatting to Nathan on last night's show about her GEA background. You were obviously very talented from a young age and you represented England at a lot of the underage levels. Like The Irish connection is incredibly strong. You shared that photo on Twitter recently of you playing at Crow Park in, what, 2007? Uh, yourself and Jack Grealish on the same team. Uh, you played a bit of Gaelic as well? Yeah, played loads of Gaelic. And I've said before that I probably prefer the Gaelic to the football. I just couldn't make a career out of Gaelic. So if I wasn't playing football now, I would still be playing Gaelic. I remember a few years ago when I was a sort of just becoming a professional player, I did a bit of Gaelic. I did a bit of a game the day before I had to have a, a game of football. And I remember being so tired. I thought, I can't, you know, I can't really do this again. And also if I got injured, but I would absolutely love to be able to still do Gaelic um, yeah you've mentioned playing at half time and I think it was the Leinster Leinster final back in 2007 went in 2006 as well it's a, it's a big thing there's a big Irish community in Birmingham where I grew up and there's loads of us that, that, that were at it my parents are obviously Irish they moved over um, something like 30, 30 odd years ago. And so those Irish roots mean a lot to me. Obviously, my accent betrays me. I was <laughs> born in England, raised over here. Um, but there is nothing like putting on that that shirt and, and representing representing Ireland. I can I can tell you that. What is it called Friday Fire Pit? Friday Fire Pit. Friday. So we just put a bit more thought into dominating the comments box. Miserable. You know that, more. miserable <laughs> you gotta call it like it is. It's Friday, like what? The Friday Fire Pit. Cameron, Kathleen, good morning to you. Ah, oh, Adrian, there you are. How What's are you? happening? What is the story? At our fire pit topic set in stone. <clears throat> and um, are we a bit late? Then you, well? you, yeah, you just nuked that, didn't you? Well, the comments are uh, lit here. It's a very real conversation that I find... I we actually a did lot. a fire pit on this exact Entire topic time. already. I think yeah. we could just do every week's fire pit. Yeah, it comes up every so often. Yeah, it does come up in my circles like that, regularly. It's also, like, it's just incredibly pointless. <laughs> It's, good it's, just, it's, it's not really though like it's a real thing it absolutely is stupid it's like but it's a but but it's also an absolutely real 
thing. I oh, know I don't. I don't or disagree you, that it exists. Me and my mates would fight over this in the public. But so, you, so you would have reasonable friends who would say no. No, listen, no, no. Sorry, okay. we'd all probably. Sorry, no, I wouldn't have reasonable friends. But no, think. most of us would not be supporting them. You know, Leinster against. I think there's, I a, lot of, if, there's a lot of Raj fans. If they were playing to lose in the final, who would you? Be, who would you and your pals be supporting? If who were playing to lose, Leinster. Oh, I'd, play, I'd be supporting Leinster. Okay. It's the, it, to be honest, it is the Raj That's effect. That's fine. So the Raj effect, I have no issue with. That's. But totally I, I, I wouldn't be out with my Leinster flag and my and my. That's that's dynamite. okay too. But like, uh, you know, there'd be a lot of people. The, my gripe around this would be the people who actively despise Leinster no, and no, no. would be out to would be. Putting on, if they were playing to lose in the final, we'd put on a red jersey and come up to No, there is this cheese and wine element of the Leinster support that, that people, some people find. Then, and wine. No, of but, so, but so what if they support to lose? Genuinely, I would su- decide on the day who I was supporting. I wouldn't give too much thought if to it. If it's La Rochelle, Cameron. I don't care. I went to the final Raj. last year and I decided, oh, do you know what, I'll go for La Rochelle today, why not? Good man, yeah, yeah. That was it. Because of, because of Raj. I, it was those two seconds on the TGV those were the moments I decided who I was going to just like support. That's it. I, it doesn't have to be this huge topic, unlike the topics we have today. So, Kathy threw this into the chat, and uh, we all wrote essays, <laughs> basically, in response. Kathy, do you want to take us through? Yeah, so this is something that I got exercised over as frustrated as Adrian is sitting beside me here, <laughs> sighing to himself in the corner, <laughs> silently fuming out. away. <laughs> um, no, well, we all know Saga are in the Connacht final this weekend. And the general chit-chat, and there is obviously merit to it, is that they're going to get absolutely hammered by Galway. Don't mind that. People can analyse the game all they want. A little bit of disrespect, I think, sometimes. There's some former Galway players were suggesting that they basically had won the Connacht final whenever they beat Roscommon and I was like you still have to turn up on the day lads and actually play a match like something might happen you never know mm. it's sport um, but this whole sort of idea that so now that Sligo are in the Connacht Championship they're in the round robin that as a small team would they not just be better being in the Telton Cup and like what's the point their whole season is now ruined because they're not in the Telton Cup and I'm like why Why is no one talking about the fact that, okay, they're in a Connacht final. That's a big deal for Sligo. It's been a long time since we were back in a Connacht final. They're not going to get into the Talton Cup. So why aren't we saying, well, what can they do over the next like couple of months? What can they achieve? They play Kildare in the first round. It's not like a unachievable aim to be like, we beat Kildare. we be able to go up against Roscommon, maybe like get absolutely hammered by Galway, improve in the next couple of weeks and then not get hammered as much by Roscommon. And like those players are learning by those experiences. But instead everyone's just like, ah no, small counties should just like write off the rest of their season. They're, there's no point them being there. They might as well pack up and go home and I don't understand it. It is very frustrating. I get very annoyed. Of it. it kind of reminds me, as I was saying yesterday, um, about that whole thing of when a smaller team is knocked out of, say, the World Cup, um, the, uh, and they play well or they have a different unique take on the game it's like oh but they've they've won a lot of friends with the way they play football don't they plucky which yeah they're plucky you know they were hard to break down which I feel is such a black like backhanded compliment this kind of ah but <laughs> weren't they cute the way they tried to play the game and sure they're lucky to be here it's it's really really irritating like surely the goal um, more to your point Kathleen is that you compete at the highest level and you see how good you are against the best teams for player development players will get huge rewards out of playing against the very best in their field as you say there's an element of luck in all of these things there's the potential for something to go totally unexpectedly um, a totally different way in the game and they could actually end up winning some teams are genuinely happy to be there but it's how you define your success I don't think you should go ah well, we missed Talton Cup this year. This feels like a, a missed opportunity. No, get to the highest level. See how good you are against the best and then let nature take its course. I, I find it very annoying, honestly. I agree. Well, I think as someone from Monaghan who have been at the top tier of league football for the last t- decade, I think... I've mentioned before, well, that's it. <laughs> well, I think, it's a, I think it's the best example here. Like It, it has only served to improve Monaghan the same way that playing in, in top tier football will improve Sligo this summer, like having three matches against good opposition compared to lesser opposition in the Talbot. Are we calling Gildare good said. opposition? Uh, Jerry's is not here, so you don't have Well, they're, <laughs> in, they're in the all Ireland round robin on merit. Yeah. They're, there, they're there on merit. No, 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 I, I, Slightly I am better joking. than Sligo opposition. Yeah. Of course. Well, yeah. Well, Gildare ran the dubs very close last weekend, it has to be said. But that, that, will, that will stand a Sligo. 100%. 
Yeah, I just I thought it was interesting because we had Mark Breckney on the show yesterday and it was kind of him that got me talking about it because he was talking about being part of that Connacht team that like was, or sorry, not the Connacht, the Sligo team that was successful in the Connacht Championship. And like, you know, he talked about getting absolutely hammered by Mayo in the Connacht final and then going on to play Jerome next. And he was like, you know, those few weeks in between we we knew we got hammered we knew there was a potential for us to get hammered again but we learned so much from that game that we took it into the drone game and he was like if we had another game after that I feel like we could have pushed on a little bit more and that's partly as well why I think the current system might benefit some of those teams if they and again like this is all dependent on the systems that are in place within a county and I'm not saying that like it's an absolute guarantee that Sligo are going to learn from it like it's very dependent on what the management take from it and what the players take from it and how they're able to capitalize on it and it's not an absolute it's just frustrating that the automatic reaction of everyone is like well sure what are, you, what, what are you doing there? Like, you might as well just yeah. give up. Winning or learning is sort of the mentality you have to take into that. What can you take away even if you get hockeyed? That there, there is something to be learned from that. I'm not, I'm not 100% down that road because I think that it's sometimes painted as a very black and white conversation about, like, um, lower level team, perceived lower level team plays against, consistently against perceived higher level teams and that that automatically results in improvement of that team. That's not always the case because... No, it doesn't automatically. For, for loads of different reasons, the county might not be... So, like, the example that I have been talking about, and this is uh, very much in the wheelhouse, in the GEA context of the elitism mm. in GEA, Kathleen, certainly in mm. terms of what you were talking about, in my view. But I think the truest example of what we're talking about should have been Cavan and Westmead this year. Sure. So, like, they, they got a whole bank of games, admittedly, against teams that are in or around their level... But the theory should have been that they were playing, you know, higher intensity games, more important games, a game against each other, um, and that that should have been replicated for Cavan. It was slightly in the league in that they did well in most games and then got promoted. And for Westmead, it wasn't particularly evident. And certainly for both game, both teams' games in Ulster, I was convinced that playing to that level in the Talton Cup last year was going to result in an uptick that's, for both That's teams. the thing. And there's no evidence of that. The, that the plays into what uh, Cathleen is saying because you're, you're saying that you know play, uh, playing Talton Cup and winning big Talton Cup games will prepare you for the following year and playing big teams. That didn't help Cavan or Westmead at all in, Le- in, no. in Ulster or Leinster this year. So but maybe, that's to maybe extrapolate that if they'd been playing like, you know, so like Westmead, so we're saying that Westmead's getting, I, I hope but I can't see Westmead winning any game in the All-Ireland Series this year and that, that we're assuming then that next year so our theory has to be that Westmead get promoted from Division 3 next year No, but see, you're, like, you're almost digging down into it my general point was more like uh, an overview of the thing being like why are we absolutely going to the automatic place everyone's head goes to is that there is absolutely no benefit for these teams whatsoever of being there. Yeah. We don't know what the benefit is yet. We haven't seen that. Mm. We can take last year's example and like the Westmead and the Cavan and say that, okay, that didn't benefit them all, at all this season. But like you also don't know, say Westmead, like winning the Talton Cup, how many of the like minor, the underage setups that saw that and they were like, oh, we can actually, like the benefits don't just necessarily come in that moment. It you know, it comes down the line to yeah. say in Sligo, the under twenties are also in uh, mm. playing this weekend against Kerry. Like those lads are looking at the lads going to the Connacht final the day after them and saying, "Well, Jesus, I I want to go to a Connacht final. I want to win a Connacht final." We've gone toe to toe with Mayo, Galway, Roscommon the last couple of years at under twenty level. I, th- I know I, it doesn't always translate, that, but can I just say on that? I think sometimes it's a disbenefit. Is that a word? to be hockeyed by those better teams consistently, it has the counter I, impact to what I, you're saying. I disagree. Sometimes. I disagree. I think, um, to your point on Cavan and Westmead, the, the dividends mightn't be immediate, but um, like you can look at it in a rugby context. There's two teams that were introduced to the major tournaments in Tier 1, which are Argentina and Italy. Argentina joined the Rugby Championship and Italy joined the Six Nations in 2000. Argentina got benefits from that straight away. They were brought up to the speed of the Tier 1 nations when their system mightn't have been as good as it could have been. And now they are a proper player at every World Cup, not just in an... Un- and Italy, it's taken 20 years, but finally, finally, at under-20s and in the women's game and even in the men's game, they are starting to catch up. I think it's been a very slow burn. 20 years later, admittedly. they're starting to catch up. Does that not undermine the theory entirely? But totally, well, it's also using the benefits of 
what you're in. You can look at hockeyings and say, oh, what is the point of us talking I, about I think every day? The, I think the Italy rugby example is good. All I'm saying is, look, I can use that, I think, to support the argument that I'm making, but I think mm. that ultimately they're, it's not black and white. It just, like, no, it's West, not, West me the, going out in Division 1 but that's what I'm again, saying, like, week in, week out. people are saying it's black. I'm, what I'm, I'm asking for some grey areas in that yeah. everyone was saying it's black and white. It's like, we're going to get hammered by Galway and mm. then they're going to go into the round robin. They're going to get hammered and everyone's going to be depressed and it's going to be awful. But like, I don't know, I'm talking to people at home this week. I met a guy that I hadn't seen in like 10 years yesterday on the street in Dublin and we were talking about the match and like there was genuine like excitement. So you're like, okay, we don't know what the result's going to be, but we're in a Connacht final. Like that's class for our, the county because we don't get that opportunity all that often. And I, I, just as another example that kind of backs up what I was trying to say earlier, like we were talking about it last night, the Vera Pau example, you know, that's an example of where a team wasn't performing to the standard that it could possibly perform, went up against some top tier nations, got like, or we get, like there were some bad results in there, but there were also some quite good results in there. And we've seen the benefit to the squad over the course of the last like 18 months. So I know there are conditions to all of these things. And I'm not saying it's an absolute that Sligo are going to go into this and be a, an amazing team next year. But I'm like, if they do get a couple of results and it does give them the momentum to build on it next year and maybe like build towards getting to more regular Connacht finals and stuff, that can only be a good thing. And I just don't want people's automatic... And it applies to plenty of small counties as well. Like, I'm not saying Sligo's the only one. That's just my best example because I am a Sligo woman. But, you know, they're there could be a benefit to this and I would rather people just like didn't write teams off completely and just say, that's it, you're gone. Why? Don't don't turn up for the rest of the summer. The uh, the point of the fire pit is that we sit around the fire pit, we throw a few things in the pit and we have a bit of discussion and... I need a bit of air now. Have a couple of cold honestly. beers and then uh, sort of go our separate ways and ah. leave a couple of things to chew on the next time we come back. Yeah. yeah. Which is what we've done here. Absolutely. Kathleen Cameron, <laughs> thanks really for coming in. That's the Friday <laughs> fire pit. Thank you what is it called Friday Fire Pit Friday Fire Pit Friday Fire Friday. so we just put a bit more thought into dominating this comments like box you know this morning this like <laughs> yes. you gotta call it like it is it's Friday like come on the Friday Fire Pit some highlights on the OTB Podcast Network. Today, we'll have Aoife Mannion, uh, who was talking to Nathan yesterday, John O'Shea and Wes Brown from The Roacher during the week, and Connor Myler as well. And you can follow uh, OTB across social and subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network after the ads. Uh, we're going to have uh, live on the line, Tyrone's All Ireland winner, Rona McNamee. He's going to chat about darkness into light. And uh, as well, during the break here, a clip from the latest episode of The Hurling Pod with James Gale, Paul Murphy and Will, where they chatted about Waterford's woeful form. And The Hurling Pod is with Borgosh Energy, proud sponsor of the Senior Hurling Championship and uh, the Legends Tour Series which takes place at Croke Park back after these. You're listening to OTB AM. AM. OTB Rugby. The detail around angles of running for me is a big one for Leinster. That's how they create opportunities. Not missing a line, not missing the timing of a run. I'm not saying they get close to perfection every time, but they get close to real quality each time they find themselves in a moment to make a difference. I think that's their point of difference. Subscribe to the Rugby Stream on the OTB Sports app now. At no stage did you really see that Waterford were going to have any sort of a kick in them at all. You know, there's so many stats here that really are just not to say remarkable stats, but it's just so telling in the whole story of the day that, you know, Desi Hutchinson was Watford's only score from play in the first half. Like that's, that's if, if you tell anyone that before the game, you know who's going to lose there. Like you can't, you can't do that. So many of the issues that I just saw with Watford, you know, they were going forward and there was just a mix up in communications. A player would try to play, force the issue in terms of passing the ball through to try and unlock the Cork defence wouldn't work out. Cork had turned it over and just used the ball really well up the pitch. Runners moving all over. And then when Cork got the ball even, there wasn't huge pressure on them. You know, you'd see Patrick Horgan drifting. You know, you'd see Dalton drifting. Whoever it was going to be sweeping around, little look at the goals and popping it over. Um, and it was just symptomatic of the day. There were so many things. Um, now, in fairness, you know, Watford had their few chances, few great saves there, a great bit of defending as well. So, But I think a, a bit of that more so was that Cork, knowing they were ahead, maybe taking the foot off the gas a small bit, opening the door for Waterford. But just Waterford were at sixes and sevens. Again, the likes of Caleb Lyons was getting on ball and trying to drive forward. But as a unit, they didn't really seem to know what they were at. Uh, and with about 15 minutes to go, you nearly just got the feeling that they were just wearing down the clock and they were just playing out the game. OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. 
All right, 18 minutes past nine. That is not me. That is Adrian Barry on your screen, but still looking good. Uh, delighted to be joined on the line now by the Tyrone senior footballer, all-star as well, Ronan McNamee, ahead of this year's Darkness Into Light, the annual fundraising event organised by Pieta and supported by Electric Ireland, which takes place tomorrow, Saturday, May 6th. Over 100,000 people will come together across 200 locations on the most important sunrise of the year as communities across Ireland rally to bring hope to people who have been impacted by suicide. To sign up to this year's event and you still have time, visit www.darknessintolight.ie. Ronan, how are things? Good morning. How's things, lads? You've got the t-shirt and all on, you're ready to get up nice and uh-huh. nice and early tomorrow morning? Yeah, up nice and early, um, but all for a good cause. It's for a brilliant cause, it has to be said, Ronan, and, and um, like I've been reading different interviews you've done over the last week or two, and maybe for people who are unaware of, of just how close an issue this is to yourself, you might just give us a, a little bit of context. I know it's an extremely difficult thing to, to talk about, but, but maybe uh, just for people unaware of your, your backstory, you might just, just tell us why exactly you're, you're an ambassador. Um, yeah, I was asked to come on this year as an ambassador, um, but very... Uh, it's something that would be very relatable to myself. Um, I went through a stage uh, maybe a number of years ago now where I was struggling with more mental health and I had to get help um, to see myself out the right side of it. Thankfully, I did come out the right side of it. Um, and as I say, it was through the likes of counselling and, and just a good support network and a, and a good surrounding of good people, um, which helped me um, through my dark days so I'm just uh, as I say I was very humbled to be asked to come on and um, be an ambassador for it this year and anything that I, f- I just feel like anything that I can do regards to pushing it or um, helping promote it in any way shape or form then I was more than happy to do so you know. Suicide seems to be one of those um, things that darkens the door of, of most in fact all communities across across Ireland it's, I'd say all of us know someone who's been uh, directly impacted. Um, you had a friend that that um, uh, took his own life in in twenty fourteen. Yeah, I had a, a friend of mine committed suicide in twenty fourteen, and it was um, it was uh, off the back of it was like small small minor details. But I remember his brother telling me one time that if if, if uh, Kevin had um, thought of how it would impact everybody else, he would never have done it. You know, because he was. Uh, a great fella and always doing doing to help other people you know so but as you say it uh, it affects a lot of families um and it's something that's probably it's more spoken about now for sure but um even at that it's probably not addressed enough in certain areas so regards to this campaign um it's great the way that it, it brings people together um and obviously um, promotes the fact that the sun will always rise tomorrow, you know, so it's a case that it might be dark today, but um, there's always going to be a positive around the corner, so it's just a matter of hanging in there, you know. It's amazing how important, and, and this is said all the time, and it's it's so right how important talking to people is, but also having an outlet. And, and I know when you were going through your, your dark period, as you say, in 2015, getting back involved with, with Tyrone, I know there was a period where you probably didn't want to, to look at a Gaelic football or, or, or go down to training whatsoever. Um you call Mickey Hart the beard, and I know a lot of the lads in Tyrone call him the beard. But how important was Mickey Hart to to that process for you in terms of of, of coming out the right side of it all? Uh, massively, uh, it was massively important to how I seen things differently because I was only seeing it through um, my own lens at the stage, and it wouldn't have been the, the clearest. So, regards to just sort of helping you get get help, get in contact with the right people. And then when I was sort of deeming myself um, finished with Yards Under County, I was really just um, didn't really want to be in that environment or was struggling with that environment. Then he was just suggesting that you surround yourself with, with positive people in a positive environment. And that, that wasn't the case that I was coming back. Um, I hadn't initially left, obviously, but... There was a stage where I hadn't been turn, uh, returning his call or going to training, and it was he just wanted me to get back up and be in that environment where everything has um, been pushed to the, for the one cause, and everybody's got the same idea and same morals, you know. So, regards to that, there um, and me seeing a positive 
aspect and a positive spring on things that that I wasn't seeing. He was huge in, you know, huge in maybe just changing how I, I looked at certain things and how I was maybe looking at life um, in general, you know. It's such a, um, an important topic to talk about, Ronan, and um, as long as you're comfortable with that, like I think there'll be a lot of people around the country tuned in this morning or picking it up afterwards that will be in tune with what you're talking about there in terms of like the calls coming in and just not being of a mindset to pick it up. Or I know you mentioned obviously there about the environment that you weren't, it wasn't something that you wanted in your life at that time. And I'm sure there are aspects of that that apply to, um, like Shay mentioned earlier on, to, to people all around us. And I'm sure there'll be people that'll be interested to know a little bit about that. Um, because of the impact that it has on people and the people around them. Is there any, can you talk to us a little bit more about that if you're comfortable with it? Yeah. Um, like, I, I was actually suggesting that the more, like for me personally, it's still not something that I would be um, brave enough to admit that I'm comfortable talking about um, because you you tend to park things an awful lot and... The, like you park them for a reason because you're not comfortable with them um, situations, you know. But mm. I feel that the more I have been um, speaking about it, then I suppose for me personally, it's doing me good that I'm I'm getting more comfortable in them surroundings, you know. But regards to the help that I got, I was seeing a counselor once a week um, for about maybe seven or eight months, and I would have been meeting the beard brave and often at that stage himself they would have just met you for for a coffee and a general catch up that wasn't the case that you were you no know, bearing your soul or anything and I don't think that needs to be the case a, a lot of the time you just it could be somebody that's maybe just in your company that it's not even that you're unloading on them but um, if you're feeling a wee bit more secure and safer then you, you, you might just be comfortable to to speak about certain things, um, but as I say, when I, f- for my own um, situation, my mum as well was a massive part of um, me healing because I was initially initially spoke to her at the start as well to tell her um, because I had cornered myself and I tried to take my own life that it was deemed to feel like I didn't obviously take my own life and. I, like I had no other option, but I felt if I was going to get out of it, then it was a matter of addressing it. And um, I felt like unloading something onto her where it was a case that she was just listening for the first while. And then being the wise woman that she is, she had plenty of, um, plenty of positive things to spring around it, you know. And ultimately, whenever you, you strip it back, it was me leaving the county would have been terrible for my own my own healing, you know, um, and I would have missed out on a lot of success with a, with a good bunch of lads. So ultimately that there, whenever you strip it back and look at that, then I made the right decision by sticking it out and obviously um, not bringing anything that suicide tends to bring with it to your own front door, you know. So um, loads of positives that came from it um, and I'm just glad that I'm here to sort of be fit to show that there is a way around things, you know, and that it's not all um, negative and just just a matter of maybe surrounding yourself with good people and in a good environment that can can be the bring the best out in you and be the the uplift that you need, you know. Mm. Uh, mothers can be amazing. It turns out, yeah. Who would have thought it? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> the so I think people can often find themselves having those thoughts or in that position running from a myriad of different ways sometimes it can be quite a sudden thing and I know that you've mentioned already obviously in relation to your friend uh, dying by suicide in 2014 was it a uh, did you find yourself getting to that position like quicker than you had expected or was it a bubbling up of stuff over a number of years I think it was a, probably a bubbling up of stuff definitely it was a bubbling up of more than one um, aspect but like I don't think you feel yourself getting to any situation. I just like I, I just remember that there was stages, like when I, whenever I do look back, that there was stages where I could have I could have done it more than once, you know. Um, but the, the initial one was when, like I had, um, ended up like cornering myself and try as I said, try and take my own life. So then I felt that I needed to address it then and there because. Whenever you were maybe 
as as low as you'd been, then it was a case of either it was going to happen again if you didn't address it or address it and 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 work things out the right way, you know. So um, I know there had been numerous, like it just didn't, it wasn't just an idea in the morning, but it was a slow build up of probably small things now when you're fit to look back at it, but they were massive at the time. Um, like, and they didn't, I didn't see any way around it other than initially I was trying to get, get away from home because all my, all my problems were dealt around your local community, you know, regards to relationships breaking down and just petty things that were, maybe you were just getting abused on certain nights out and stuff like that there that were like you would have taken massively to heart, you know, mm. and you didn't know how to deal with them and you couldn't park them well. And then, as I say, it was just a combination of one or two things on top of a, of a, of a grievance that was initially going to push you over the edge, you know? So, and it, like, as I say, I can look back at it now and, you know, be more annoyed at myself for, for letting it get to that stage. Um, but at that, back then that, I never once um, thought of what it would affect or how it would affect anybody else. All I could see was through, as I say, through moon lens at that stage, and it was uh, it was a blurry one at that, you know. And how are you doing now, Ronan? I like a lot better, um, a lot better. Like, but I was actually chatting to a friend of mine last night, and see the likes of it, like speaking about it and stuff. It like makes a lot of it still very raw. So. Um, Still, as I say, still learning myself as I go, but but being able to um, talk about it and address uh, aspects of my own side still, then it can only benefit me. And as I say, if it benefits anybody else in the meantime, then I'm happy, more than happy to do so, you know. And you can be certain that there are people that will be uh, tuned in to you this morning and listen over the next course of the next few days. I'm sure runners as well that'll take plenty from what you're saying. Like it's so important that people like you, your your voice of having been there and done that, um, and and the experiences that you've had. I'm sure there'll be people that'll play, take um, plenty from it as well. Are you? Are you? Are you? It's not the first time that you've spoken about it. You've done interviews uh, touching it before. Have you found that you know your voice about it is resulting in? Um, people been in contact with you about it or like having that experience that you talked about where actually just the act of speaking about it can help? Um, on a lot of occasions, most mostly it's like it's positive as I say. Um, like I, it's, it, it's something that as I, I keep <laughs> reiterating, reiterating to that it's not a, something that I'm comfortable speaking about um, but I'm getting more comfortable speaking about it and it, the fact that like I, I probably didn't speak about it initially at the start just because I felt that there would be flack involved with it because maybe it's something that's spoke about a lot more now and like you see a lot more um, people coming out with no one talking about it and it can come across, people can maybe take it across the wrong ways if it's just um, uh, maybe just a publicity stunt in certain aspects and maybe to try and get your 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 face out there in, in ways and that, like that's why I wouldn't I was never comfortable um speaking about it because you, you were bringing attention to yourself that you necessarily might not want it but um but the older you get the less you care about about um the likes of negative um and passive comments like that so like I'm 31 now so it's a matter of like there's levels that would be um, griping you at this stage. And as I say, if I'm fit to pass on something to somebody else that might be 10 years younger and, and struggling, um, then I'm more than happy to do so, you know. And they're obviously uh, difficult uh, subjects to speak about, Ronan, so fair play for, for yeah. speaking out on them. And, and for anyone who is probably affected by some of the topics we're talking about as well, there are loads of numbers out there for contact lines 24-7 as well. Pieta provide a, a range of suicide and self-harm prevention services. Uh, you can free phone 1800 247 247 or text help to 51444. Samaritans as well, free phone 116 123 uh, for anyone affected by anything that we've been uh, speaking about this morning. Ronan, I can't believe how, how busy a man you are as well. I didn't realise you have all these um, uh, little things going on in your life. Aside from the fact that you're, you're training in Gavahi constantly, you're, you're, you've you're got the, the gym business set up, that's as well as the day yeah. job. So you're a busy man. Did I read somewhere six in the morning you leave the house and you're maybe not, maybe not back till 10 o'clock at night? 
Yeah, um, that's a, that's the a normal now at this stage. So uh, I think I've, I've said it a few times that the, the busier you are, the the better it is for yourself. And in, in ways, don't get me wrong, some downtime at times doesn't doesn't go amiss. But um, I have set up a man with a friend of mine, Anoma. Um, he is a wee re- a reformer Pilates business and a and a physio business. So I have a wee gym and along with him, and uh, and I work with Worth Worth Ireland during the day. So um, quarter past eight to five with them, and then straight to Gavahi to run run around a, <laughs> a grass field for another two hours on top of that. You know so. Um, but all worthwhile, all for the cause, you know. And if it if it deems that you'd be successful at the end of it, then you'll 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 do you'll do anything to make that, you know. Uh, I'm not going to slag you about the the Monaghan result. That that'll be a stretch too far. Although I've been biting my tongue the entire interview, I have to say. Um, but but you've you've had the, the, I guess the benefit, Ronan, and this is the thing now. But the provincial championships, there's almost the benefit of getting knocked out early, if, if if that makes sense in terms of you've got a significant number of weeks to prepare for this round robin phase now. Um, so just looking at Tyrone's, so Group Two, you'll be with the the Connacht winner which we assume this weekend, with all respect to Sligo, will be Galway. Uh, the Ulster runner-up so will be the loser of Derry Armagh, uh, yourselves and Westmeath. So it looks like your fixtures are going to be away to Galway on the 20th or 21st of May, then you're home to the Ulster runners-up on the 3rd or 4th of June, and then you'll, you'll play Westmeath on the 17th or 18th of June in a, in a neutral venue. So how are you feeling about, uh, about the group setup, and have you been, been analysing the, the prospective opponents just yet? Um, obviously, it's still pretty fresh. Um with that only being made in Tuesday, but you had a fair idea that there was going to be a couple of big ties along the way somewhere, like mm. you were going to do well to avoid um, to avoid getting a strong encounter somewhere. So obviously starting off a way to go is going to be an extremely difficult one, but but if you're to be realistic, and I'm sure every every county team that's taken part is going to be realistic of, of um, making a, a few big shocks and hopefully... It's been a long summer, but we'll just, as I say, look forward to the likes of what's coming around the corner. And it's 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 good that you know certain dates and certain oppositions now. At least there was a, there was a couple of weeks there where um, you didn't necessarily know, you know, so you were just maybe getting the getting the miles and the legs at times. So um, obviously the modern result wasn't the result that we wanted, but um, it was a carriage that we're dealt now at this stage. So. Um, just we're good to get a couple of weeks under the belt um, and uh, readdress things and then just as I say look forward to what's coming and the weekend of the 21st you know Ronan a delight uh, catching up with you hard topics over the last 20 minutes or thereabouts but you're a great advocate for uh, the topic at hand um, and uh, as Shane alluded to um, you know, find myself in the unenviable position of a county that you're about to meet over the next few weeks wishing you well uh, for what's ahead for the summer but uh, thanks a million for jumping on no problem, man. Thank you. Fair play. Ronan McIntyre, Toronto footballer there. Uh, really interesting stuff. And uh, Shane obviously has given out the details of the various lines if you would like to make contact with any of those. Uh, right, that is it uh, almost from us on OTBAM uh, for this morning. Still Imogen Carter to come. By the way, on uh, Monday's show, Jaron Shane are going to be bringing you the Gillette Labs performance rankings. We'll have the fallout from the Premier League games of the weekend. Sarah Donovan uh, will be with us. Alan Quinlan, Anthony Moyles and plenty more as well uh, besides... Have we time to touch on Coronation Street? I did, have, no I did, have, a, did have a great few column shaking said, You're but not can, happy. I, can I just make the point? Go on. The, the car, Coronation is on RT1 television mm. between 10am and 2pm tomorrow and it's really grinded my gears. It just, it's ridiculous. If only we had somebody who was headed in to Montrose this evening yeah. to, you know, that could bend the ear. Fly some of. flags and banners. I, I just think, look, nothing against anyone who wants to watch the Coronation, who's Irish, not for me personally, but a lot of people watch the Crown and, and yeah, I, they're into the royal family for, for salacious reasons. Um, salacious but, but reasons. You can watch you can watch it on BBC or ITV. Uh, you can watch it in different places. I think an Irish state uh, channel showing the coronation of the, the British uh, king, the monarchy, is uh, is beyond... Well, if we're going to be a 32-county nation, then I think we've got to cater for everybody, Shane. 32-county, yeah. 32-county republic. Not a monarchy. It's It's ridiculous. Outrageous. Sorry. Sorry, Colin. Whatever, Had to get that in there. whatever you're watching this weekend, whatever you're watching Enjoy this it. weekend, have fun. Have a wonderful weekend. Good luck. All right. Delighted to be joined by the professional Irish cyclist Imogen Cotter. Imogen, how are things? Very good. Happy to be here today um, in Dublin. 
launching the ad campaign with Skoda and RSA. So, yeah. Nice to be home. I can imagine. And it's, I know it's a whistle-stop tour for you, as these things tend to be, but um, you're, you're here for good reason, and you've been picked as an ambassador for, for good reason by the RSA and by Skoda Ireland because you have had a mad year, year and a bit. Um, a lot of people will be familiar with your story, but I guess for those who aren't, maybe tell us what happened on, on January 26th of, of last year. So January 26th of last year, um, I suppose... Up until that point, I kind of have to tell like the backstory because I think what makes uh, the story a story is like I had had like a really long road to get to where I was. I had been, uh, I was, I had just signed my first professional contract. So up until that point, I'd been really trying. I had been working in Belgium. I moved there. I didn't know the language. I, um, you know, I just really wanted to make this happen. And I... I had signed my first professional contract and I just won the national champ. So, you know, in cycling, you get to wear a a special jersey all year. Um, So it was like everything was coming together. I just moved country. I had moved to Girona. It was like, you know, all looking rosy. (laughs) And then 26th of January, I was out on a bike ride. And I had done testing that week. Um, All of my power numbers were up. You know, I had a big racing calendar ahead. And just like 10 minutes from home I was cycling around like a a bend um a slight bend in the road and there at the apex of the bend there was a side road um and I saw a van beginning to overtake another cyclist on the other side of the road um and I thought he was cutting it fine I thought like what is he doing Mm. it's he doesn't have enough time to make it back to his side of the road um but yeah in instead of going back to his side of the road he continued on a racing line towards the side road at the apex and he hit me head on at about 60 70 kilometers an hour i was going about 30 um and yeah it was pretty catastrophic i had really awful injuries i um shattered my patella i damaged my patellar tendon i ruptured completely my quadriceps tendon i broke a chunk off my femur and I shattered my wrist and I had like a lot of cuts and bruises and everything as well all over my body. I can imagine the, <laughs> the, the pain of, of that and the, and the following weeks and months as well. Like, do you, what do you remember of the, the impact itself? Is it much or is it nothing or what's your, your memories of that moment? Uh, in that moment, I remember seeing the van coming towards me and I remember, first of all, thinking I'm about to die uh, and I remember feeling that really strong, I'm about to die or I'm about to get really, really hurt. And then I just remember the the crack of hitting the the windscreen because I shattered the whole windscreen. So I remember so clearly, like for for weeks afterwards, I was waking up because I could just hear that that crack. It was such a loud noise. And and then I just remember waking up on the the side of the road. And the first thing I was thinking was, I can't believe I'm alive. I, I said that sentence, like, I can't believe I'm alive because I thought so so clearly that I was going to die. Uh, it was a matter of a couple of inches, two or three inches was probably the difference between yeah. survival and not. Yeah, for sure, because if you think about on the windscreen, there's like the pillar at the side, mm. and I was just, you know, I'd say inches from hitting that pillar, and luckily I only hit the, the glass, but yeah, it was pretty... It was very close. It was like definitely a near-death experience. It's not just like a term I can throw around. Like, I really was so blessed to not die that day. So I remember, you, you, I think you've spoken before, but the, and it's a phrase I hadn't heard before, the happiness watts, where, you know, a cyclist is in a moment of nirvana, they're having a great time, the, the, the speed is good. So funny enough, ironically enough, on that cycle, you're having a pretty good cycle at the time. Yeah, yeah. No, I was, I was way, like, I was about 20 watts higher than I needed to be in that moment. And I was like, on that bike ride, I was just like, oh god my legs are feeling amazing I, I was about to go next week I was about to go off on a training camp with my new team and I was thinking like oh this is amazing like I'm gonna absolutely be flying this season and then all of a sudden yeah it yeah I was too uh, you know it's funny because in that moment I remember thinking like uh, and afterwards I remember thinking if I hadn't been going so well I wouldn't have been there at that exact moment in time like the stars all had to align for me to be there at that moment in time, for him to be there, for the other cyclists to be there. And and yeah, so I kind of really struggled afterwards and, and maybe this sounds a bit airy-fairy, but like to, to think what was the purpose of it happening, you know? And I think that's something you can only maybe relate to if you have like a near-death experience. You kind of do think like, why, 
would this happen and why am I still alive? Why am I here? And, and I read a lot about it, like people struggling, you know, to, to find their purpose or to realise what their purpose was after an accident like that. So it kind of sent me into a bit of a existential crisis for a while, yeah. What were the, what were the months thereafter like? I mean, I can imagine, as you say, there's surgeries, there's physio, there, there are probably sleepless nights and, and moments where you're having panic attacks and, and I guess recollections of what happened. So I can imagine those months thereafter were extremely difficult. Yeah, they were extremely difficult and I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think because there was so much uncertainty, it was more difficult because I couldn't walk properly for the first three three months after the surgery. I had only 60 degrees range of motion in my legs, so I was thinking the whole time that I was there, I was thinking like, okay, I'm making maybe one degree of progress in physio every day, but I mean... I want to cycle again, like I want to be a professional cyclist, I worked so hard for this. And I, I just remember thinking like, ha, I wanted to, I wanted it so badly, but I remember going to a knee uh, consultant mm. in Belgium, um, that was about three months afterwards, and when I went into him, and he sat me down and he said, this is really bad. And I remember like, really, having a panic attack there and then I didn't even ask him will I cycle again I said like will I walk again because I just didn't know what was ahead of me and you know I was so lucky this guy he's one of the best knee surgeons that there is and a lot of cyclists go to him and you know he operated on my leg again and he he actually found a piece of my bike still in my knee when he operated me three months later there was so much scar tissue I had been like hacked open basically it was like really I've got a massive scar on my knee um, and it was really, you know, I was really lucky to get to go to him to, because at that stage I had already said, okay, I will not cycle again in professional peloton. I had that, that hope that I would, but I didn't think I would. And I thought I would just, I thought I would go into paracycling. That was, I was already thinking, okay, I will not go back to my career. I cannot imagine cycling in the world tour peloton again, but I will still do something. I will get back to competing in some capacity. Uh, did I read somewhere you, you, you uh, utilised the uh, option of a hypnotist as well at, at different times? Like, is that How did that help you or was that something that you found useful? I'm sure people go to therapists and hypnotists and, and try every... You, you're going to try anything as a professional cyclist to get back on the bike. Yeah, the, the hypnotherapy was more to deal with the fear that I had. I, I kind of... I was really afraid of getting back on my bike and I think when you... It's something when you injure yourself so badly and then you put in so much work to get just back to a normal level of functioning, you can't imagine putting yourself into a scenario again where you'll hurt yourself again or where you potentially will hurt yourself again. And so I had that fear that I was in races, but I was thinking like, if I crash, I, oh, what about my knee? What about my wrist? Like, I've worked so hard to get them back to this level. Will I you know, would I undo all of my hard work? And so I, I went to a hypnotherapist for that. And, you know, it might sound, again, a little bit airy-fairy, but actually that really helped me. I, I do listen to a lot of hypnosis to fall asleep and everything. Just, yeah, it's something I really believe in. Like, your subconscious mind is always taking things on. So I just try and bombard it with positivity. I'm sure family and friends come into that as well, and the people around you, like, the, for, for those number of months, and even up to now, I guess, having those people around you that you can sp speak to and talk to and, and help you get through it was so important. Yeah, for sure. And I made sure that everyone around me was very positive. I didn't allow people to like, I thought that was really important for me in my recovery was that I did not allow negativity to come into it. Mm. I remember like the first physio session I was able to go to, um, you know, I said to him, even if my knee is really bad, just tell me it's amazing because it's amazing. And the first time I went with the the doctor for the insurance company of the driver who you know I meant to tell him everything is so bad mm. I went into him and he was like your knee is very bad and I said no my knee is amazing <laughs> like it is going to be the best knee in the peloton <laughs> so I really like did not want to accept anything negative into my circle because I just thought yeah it's a shit sorry can I can, it's a shit enough situation as it is you know let let me try and at least control what I can control which is how I respond to it then what about the, the, the system and, and, and I guess the result of, of an accident like this? So someone in a, in a van hit you, as you say, was, was coming around the corner, the wrong side of the road. Yeah. I think I just got their licence maybe the, the month before. Mm -hmm. and, and what happened as well to, to uh, Davide Rebidan, the, yeah. the, the cyclist who, who was tragically killed in a, in a eerily similar 
yeah. uh, crash. Um, I think the person that hit him had, had been involved in a similar incident before, mm -hmm. fled the scene as well after the crash that killed Rebellan. Uh, what, what do you want to see change or come out of this? Um, because when it comes to cyclists, and, and it's the same on, on, on the Dublin road as well, cyclists are often seen as not, not human. Right? You yeah. forget the stories that these people have, have families and lives of their own, you know? Yeah. That's something I really spoke about in this ad campaign and it was something I was really conscious that I wanted to bring forward. Like what I would like to change out of this is that somebody sees my story and slows down. And, you know, like you say, there's this massive disconnect between drivers and cyclists and they don't see cyclists as humans. They see them as obstacles in their way that they need to get past as quickly as possible. But they forget how vulnerable we as cyclists feel on the road. Like we as cyclists, we just want to get home alive. Yes. And sorry if we're holding you up for five seconds, for 10 seconds, but these people have whole lives and, and they're a person outside of that 10 seconds that they're holding you up. And for me, I want to see that change. I want to see drivers looking at cyclists as humans and giving us the respect and the space that we need. It is so, it's scary when you're a cyclist on the road and it's not something, it's something we can change. All that you need to change is your attitude towards the cyclist and seeing them as a human. Like it's not, it's not a difficult thing when you put it in human terms like that. Um, that's really what I want to see change because I don't have the power to change something like, you know, the law. I can't change that. The guy who hit me, he never got a penalty point. He never got a fine, nothing. You know, he is, I've passed him driving on the road and that's horrific for me. And well, the he, same guy since. Yeah, yeah. Actually, a mad story. I, my dad was visiting a couple of weeks ago and uh, we were on like an easy ride uh, and he, I was passing nearby the place where the accident happened. I said, Dad, will we go down to the place where it happened? And so my dad has all the pictures on his phone of like when he had gone to the scene a couple of days afterwards. So we went there and, uh, you know, I stood where I was standing when the van hit me and my dad like stood where the paint markings were on the road and we like measured the distance, how far my body had gone, blah, blah, blah. And as we were standing there, just like, at this junction in the road, a, a van came around the corner and I said to dad, like joking, oh, watch out, like, and it was the fucking guy no way. driving the car as I'm standing on the spot where he had left my body, do you know? What are the chances of that? Like? What are the chances? It was like a movie. It was just the most bizarre thing. And so like, you can imagine how traumatic that is. Like that, that really, I was crying like I could barely get home on the bike that was so traumatic for me and you know I can't control that he has no punishment I that's that's up to the law and I give it over to them but I can hopefully change the way that somebody might hear my story and might think okay that's a person on the road that's somebody who might have you know worked towards this for 10 years like I did worked towards getting a professional contract or it's just somebody trying to get home from work yeah. and that's what I hope I can change that's insane and like uh, PTSD is a thing for a lot of people when it, when, when it comes to, to things like this and accidents like has it been easy for you in terms of getting back on a bike like I, I can imagine the first time for example you got back on a bike it was maybe traumatic certainly something that, that triggers certain memories. Well, I actually think I was so happy to be back on the bike that I don't know if it was traumatic. I remember I got back on the bike and after like 20 meters I unclipped because I was in the cleats and I unclipped and I was like, oh my God, I was crying. I was really afraid. But actually, I don't think I've experienced as much PTSD on the bike, you know, probably off the bike if I'm watching my story back or if I'm thinking this time a year ago I couldn't walk, then it's quite difficult for me. But actually on the bike, I don't feel it as much. I'm definitely more afraid in the peloton, like when I'm, when I'm racing. Um, but I'm thinking that's something that will just come back with time. Uh, and I'm more, I'm more vocal, I think, towards drivers. Mm. Like in the past, I might not have had the same, um, I might have had the same caution. No, I was very cautious before, but I might not have been as vocal about like, please give me space. Whereas mm. if somebody comes into my space now, I'll be like, oh, sorry, I'm about to curse again. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> like, you know, I'll be really annoyed that somebody will in encroach on me. And, and I think that, uh, not that we have to do that as cyclists, because definitely I, I try, you know, if somebody's nice to me, I will always give them the salute, like, thank you. But I think as well, like, it's because I'm afraid 
and sometimes I might like overreact. Like I remember a woman like pulled out like reverse quickly out of her drive and, and nearly hit me a few months ago and I lost it. And and if somebody <clears throat> had been recording me in that moment, I would have been so embarrassed. But when I got like a hundred meters further down the road, I just burst into tears because it's because I'm afraid. And the thing is like, you don't know as a driver what cyclists have gone through before. Maybe there's somebody like me out on the road. So if you're beeping at them, if you're shouting at them out the window, like maybe they have PTSD as well. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, there just needs to be more empathy, please. <laughs> it's not much to ask really when you think about it. Um, and texting while driving is another thing. And, and like we see the sign for the cycle safety campaign launched behind you. And uh, that's one issue that I think a lot of cyclists bring up quite commonly mm. because as you say like if someone looks at their phone for even all of 5 10 15 seconds mm. that could be fatal yeah yeah exactly like it's just that lapse in concentration um and i don't know whether the guy who hit me was driving or was texting while driving but yeah it's just you especially if you're driving in a built-up area i mean at all times you should not be on your phone but if you're driving somewhere like dublin or galway or limerick or wherever cork like you don't have you don't have that uh, that moment where you can control your speed like you, if you're letting it go for five seconds you're you're missing out on a moment where a cyclist could have to avoid a pothole or you know I, I know I sound like I'm harping on and I know that people are probably sick of me doing this because I'm on social media I post about it all the time like safe driving blah 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 but it is something I feel so passionately about like because I am so vulnerable on the road and I just want to get home alive like I don't uh, I just don't know why it's something I should have to worry about, you know, is if is somebody going to kill me today? Mm. You know, it's my job to go out and train. I have to train every day, but it's very scary to do it sometimes. You're clearly someone who's embraced this role, like you've been thrust into it as a result of what happened, but you, you, you wear the role of ambassador remarkably well, like you speak so eloquently about it as well, which is which is amazing, but you probably don't even realise the impact it could have on on drivers who maybe don't think of cyclists or maybe do think of cyclists and, and just dislike them for whatever reason. Mm. So do, I guess the question is, do you realise the, 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 the impact that maybe you're having? I don't realise it, but I hope I am. Uh, and I think what it is, is seeing somebody young. Like people think of cyclists, they think male, middle-aged maybe. I'm a young female, well, young, I'm, I'm nearly 30. I'm nearly 30 as well, so that, that, is, that is young, I'm very young. young. <laughs> um, I'm a very young female cyclist, and, you know, I'm, uh, you know, it can happen to me. I'm a professional. I think maybe some people think people get hit by a car, and it's because, oh, they were, like, doddering about on the road, and they weren't paying attention. I was doing my job. I was on my side of the road. I was not breaking any rules of the road. And I'm a young, fit person, and I was hit and could have died. Do you know? And I think that we're used to to seeing cyclists as older males, but if somebody sees my story and like they think, oh yeah, okay, it can happen to anybody. That that's what I hope um, can come from it. But yeah, I hope I'm. I hope I can do this role well. I hope I can change something or slow one person down. Uh, that would for me. That I think that's why. You know, I spoke about your purpose in life. I think that's what what I was kept here for, maybe. You know, maybe my story can change something. What does the tattoo say again? You said you have a tattoo. Yeah, I got Am I allowed to reveal that? <laughs> I got a tattoo. It was a tattoo I'd wanted for ages, and I got it just after my accident. Um, I got miles to go in my dad's writing and before I sleep in my mum's. Um, oh, cute. That is very, very cute, cute, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, no, it's from my Robert Frost poem. And, yeah, lots to achieve before I die, I guess, is... It's a perfect way to, to, I guess, wrap with the question because we have the benefit of being able to ask you about your cycling ambitions now because I know, like, I think 2017 it was when you first started getting into cycling properly. Yeah. Um, so what are the ambitions now that you can compete again, you can get back on the bike? You're living in Barcelona at the moment, so what's the, what's, what's the plan for the next three to five years, I guess? Well, my goal is to go world tour. Um, I want to get to the highest level of team that I can. Um, I want to go to the Europeans and the world and represent Ireland. Um, but you know, there's another cyclist, uh, Bernal. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. him, but he was uh, he was hit two days before me. He was hit by a car, and I remember reading his and, and thinking, "Oh my God, I can't believe what's happened to Bernal." And now I see him back in the World Tour peloton. It's very motivating for me. But he said, like, 
if I don't win any other races, I've won the race for life. And that's something that I feel like when I read that line, I was like, yeah, I'm still so driven to do my job and I still have so much I want to achieve. But I'm also very aware that my life took a different path at the time where it was all going in an upward trajectory with cycling. I was, you know, going to be a great cyclist that year and and my path got changed without my control, but um, I'm back competing. I'm very happy about that and I still have big goals, but I'm also very aware that like I have won a massive race for life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. On that note, uh, keep Keep racing the race for life. It's been brilliant uh, chatting to you, Imogen, and, and you're you're a wonderful ambassador for what you do as well. Um, so yeah, keep 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 at it and uh, keep fighting the good fight. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Brilliant stuff. OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now.